I guess I better get started. How does one write a journal? Ugh, uh, hello. I'd very much rather not be doing this. But here I am, on Guild Orders, on a ship to a faraway town to learn my lesson, I guess. This journal is part of my punishment, and I don't think I can avoid it this time. Dundorma was very clear. I am going to go help out in this backwater village, and I'm going to record my... thoughts and feelings. All because I made one mistake. Curses, this is why I prefer working alone. The hunt, the thrill, the violence, that is all that matters. All this bureaucratic Aptonoff dung about rules and oh please get along with your teammates makes me wretch. Ugh, but what good is complaining now? The ship is almost at its destination. Onwards, I suppose. To a dumb lesson I don't want to learn. To, hopefully, lots of beasties I can kill. Onwards, to Kamura. Walking off the ship, I could smell the stench of people. Sweat, sweets, and laughter. Within seconds, the sounds and scents of Kamura village filled my senses. I thought I was going to get a headache. I was greeted by a masked hunter, his chainmail armor fitted with select parts from a Zenogre. I initially thought this might be a kindred soul, a warrior, but I was quickly proven wrong. His enthusiastic introduction soured me so much, I barely caught his name. Utsuki? Ukbuki? Uh, who cares? As we walked through the village, this insufferable rag of a man kept babbling about his precious Kimura. How they are oh so close to each other, and how everyone is oh so nice. How much fun they have together, and how good his imitation of a Zenogre is. I barely listened to his descriptions of how his pupil slayed a powerful beast the other day, Magna something, and lost myself in defiant thought. The villagers shot curious glances at me and my greatsword. Pah, I thought, they should have seen my actual sword before it was confiscated. The thought brought with it a wince of pain. My prized greatsword, made of glorious Rathalos shells and claws, had been taken from me by the guild after the incident. They had instead gifted me a bare hunk of metal, barely even worth the name Sword. A new beginning, one administrator called it. <laughs> right. One thing in Utsuktsi's ramble caught my attention. He mentioned that the village must always be ready for evacuation due to the rampage. I stopped him and asked what he meant. According to Ushugi, the valley around Kamura produces a bizarre phenomenon in which countless monsters stampede towards the village in a frenzied rage. In fact, the village I now stood in was technically new Kamura. Old Kamura had been laid to waste in the last great rampage 50 years ago. The creature that had been slain the other day, Magnamus or whatever, is said to be an omen of the rampage. Thus, the village was apparently in a heightened alert state these days. The man seemed a little confused at my reaction. My energized glee must have been quite apparent. But who could blame me? Violence, glory, combat, now that is more like it. Usaki led me to my quarters and scurried off, seemingly a little uncomfortable with my presence after that conversation. Fine by me. I sat down and accommodated my stuff, after which I started writing in this journal, that is to say in you… this is still really weird. 
Well, the whole purpose of this is to reflect. So fine. Let's do that. Let me recount what exactly led me here. Should anyone ever read this, there will be no ambiguity as to what I did and how I was treated for it. I, prior to this, had a spotless record. My career as a hunter was nearly flawless. So what if I mostly took solo jobs? So what if I never captured monsters properly? If you wanted something dead, I was your guy. My hunts were smooth and efficient, and I didn't need any sniveling wusses to tell me how to behave. I thought for sure my stellar track record meant that I was set. Fat chance. A few months ago, I was on my way back from a job when a dazed Kelby ran into me. Usually these pests are such cowards that they'll immediately run off when seeing anything. This one exceptionally stupid individual, however, seemed confused, simply staring at me like a curious child. On its forehead, I spotted the characteristic bumps of growing Kelby horns. They can fetch a fortune if harvested either as a full horn or in powder form. Grinning, I took the opportunity. One swing cleaved the Kelby in half, a pitiful yelp escaping its throat at the very last moment. I carved off the small horns and simply continued on my way, already thinking of what I'd buy with the money. Well, as soon as I walked into Dundorma, the Guardians immediately confiscated my weapon and dragged me up to Guild HQ. Apparently, one of the city's observation balloons had seen me kill that Kelby from afar and swiftly send a message bird over to the city. Why the observatory would look at me instead of the elder dragons they are supposed to be monitoring, no idea. The guild tribunal accused me of poaching, the act of illegally killing a monster without an associated quest. They were utterly deaf to my explanations. It was just a Kelby an inferior, meaningless creature barely qualifying as alive. Could a meager herbivore truly be worth punishing one of their most efficient hunters? Apparently, it could. I was locked up for a while, awaiting my judgement, until I was released into this new assignment. I would avoid the worst possible punishment under the condition that I leave Dundorma and aid a small town in a desperate conflict a long-term quest that would force me to interact and cooperate with others. I guess they hoped that that would socialize me and quote-unquote fix me. It still seems so ridiculous to me. My career, my skills, my fame, none of it mattered when weighed against the life of a single Kelby. Has the world gone mad? I have to rest. This has been exhausting. Tomorrow, my punishment begins in earnest. Oh, brother, where do I even begin? It's been a few days now since my last entry, and frankly, it is hard to communicate just how much has happened. I guess I'll try? Shortly after arriving in Kamura, the village elder, a respectable man of conviction and strength named Fugen, gathered the villagers to announce a new discovery. Through research and observation, they had sighted a bizarre new phenomenon. The rampages seemed to often be followed by the appearance of odd monsters, creatures previously known to the guild but changed. Blackened skin and glowing red scars litter their bodies, and their aggression elevates their danger to newfound levels. These were now dubbed Apex Monsters, and every hunter in the village was to set out to investigate them, for they might hold the key to uncovering the truth about the rampage. By the end, all I needed to know was that I had to investigate the shrine ruins alongside Utsuki or whatever. So we packed our things and headed out. The shrine ruins lie just outside of the village, so our job was extra important. Camping out in the bamboo forest, surrounded by ruined temples, I was overcome with one emotion. Boredom. The promise of powered up monsters had piqued my interest for sure, but was that challenge really worth waiting around in the forest, twiddling my thumbs and trying my best to ignore Ushugi? 
Not really. But before long, my boredom was washed away. As we surveyed the ruins, we both began noticing a weird tension in the air. A thunder element monster was nearby, its elemental organ electrifying the area. But usually, you notice it much more underwater. For most land dwellers, this phenomenon usually only extends to a few short meters away from their bodies. We could feel the presence of thunder, but there was no monster nearby. This meant that this creature was likely extremely powerful. This was more like it. My blood began to dance in my veins, ready for action. I could not suppress a grin. Uzuki said something to me, but I barely heard him. My instincts had kicked in, and now my years of experience manifested as a seamless sequence of movements. I knew what he was likely telling me anyway. The best way to track down a powerful thunder monster is to simply feel out the static current in the air and follow it as it increases in intensity. I ran ahead, leaving my companion to try and catch up using his wacky wirebug thing. The beat of my lifeblood was drumming in my skull as I hurried towards the source of the current, further, further still, until, on a clearing, I found it. It mostly looked like a Xenogre. It was shaped like a Xenogre and was roughly Xenogre sized. But beyond those outward characteristics, it was quite different. Its fur was yellowed, and its scales were dark green, broken up by black and red scars. This was, without a doubt, an apex Xenogre. I had never seen anything like it, I thought at first. But before I had even finished that thought, another interjected. Wait, or have I? I shook my head and removed all thought. Now was not the time for the brain. Now was the time for the heart, the convulsing center of blood, to take over. I leapt onto the beast, and unsurprisingly, it reacted almost immediately. Within seconds, a familiar but distorted howl erupted as the Xenogre's fur alighted with a golden shimmer. It had already charged up its thunder. By the time my companion arrived, the air was dancing with bolts of yellow electricity, each one fully capable of vaporizing a man in an instant. Not me, though. Wielding a hunk of iron, I weaved through each attack, continuously building up my momentum to unleash a powerful slash onto the beast. As the fight progressed, my memory returned. I finally knew what this creature reminded me of. Many years ago, Dandorma had sent me, alongside other hunters, to the Waikademy as a knowledge exchange exercise. There, in Berna, we had heard of the many unique creatures the Waikademy had discovered, chief among them, the Deviants. These were abnormal individuals, monsters pushed to the absolute limits of their strength by extreme conditions. And wouldn't you know it, a deviant Xenogre develops green scales and yellow fur and equally yellow thunder. This apex Xenogre was thus extremely similar to the deviant Thunderlord Xenogre. Why this similarity existed, I didn't care to investigate at the time. I was much more interested in what this discovery meant for my fight. Thunderlord Xenogre have a well-known weakness, and I was eager to test if this also applied to this apex Xenogre. Without wasting an instant, I began heading straight for the creature, running at it in as much a straight line as I could muster. Before the Xenogre could do much, I had reached it, swinging the blunt side of my blade directly into its face. The enhanced charge of a Deviant Xenogre is not an instinctual ability like the normal charge of a regular Xenogre. It has to be maintained consciously. This means that, while the Ultra Charge is many times more powerful than anything a regular Xenogre can produce, sufficient head trauma will forcefully shut this ability down, causing an electric chain reaction that releases the tension in the monster's muscles, toppling it down to the ground 
helplessly flailing for an extended period of time. My gamble paid off. As my blade landed on the Zenogre's forehead, its golden thunder aura instantly dissipated and the beast slumped to the floor, yelping and whining like a wounded dog. It was done for. The beat of my heart droned in my ears. It compelled me. It lifted my sword arm. It swung it down with all my strength. To the rhythm of my boiling blood, I decapitated the helpless wyvern in a single swing. The rush of victory enveloped me. Ah, <sighs> I still had it. I was still me. I turned around to look at my companion, who would surely be agape in awe. But all my eyes found was an expression of shock and disappointment. In his hands, Utsushi had been readying trap materials. He shook his head in silent disapproval. We had been ordered to investigate these apexes, to study them. It was clear that in his eyes, the fight should have ended the moment the Zenogre fell. Killing it, and so brutally at that, was unnecessary to him. For a moment, a familiar sensation overcame me. Defiant apathy. I had seen this look before, and as always, I was ready to shake it off. I do things my way, and if some wuss wanted to object, that was his problem. But this time, something felt different. Utsushi had been nothing but enthusiastic and welcoming. He had done all he could to immerse me, an uncooperative stranger, into his home. To see his attitude change, to see him look at me with sad disappointment, filled me with a feeling I cannot quite describe. I did not like it. I could feel myself shrink. After that, we reconvene in Kamura with the other groups, as well as Elder Fugen. While many had sighted apexes, only Utsushi and I had actually engaged it. The Elder expressed regret at the fact that we had slain it instead of trying to observe it more, but the local guildmaster, a rotund Wyvarian named Hojo, immediately began quizzing me about it. I found myself to be unusually talkative, compelled to give the most complete answers I could. After I mentioned that the Apex Zenogre reminded me of a Deviant, Hojo lit up, demanding I explain the Deviant state. Upon hearing that it is an abnormality produced by harsh conditions, he grew ecstatic. Hojo explained that he had long suspected that the Apex monsters were not perpetrators of the Rampage, but victims of it. Their many recent scars suggested that they had been severely wounded, and that the resulting rage further stirs monsters around them to flee, causing massive stampedes of monsters running away from the Apexes, which are themselves running away from whatever hurt them. My input about Deviance was the final piece of evidence he needed to confidently propose his theory. Apparently, the Kamura region was home to many legends about calamitous beings whose winds scar the land and inspire fear. Long ago, a nearby city called Tsukito is said to have been destroyed by such a being, and that in the aftermath of a similar incident that decimated the shrine ruins, Surviving monsters and humans alike were riddled in scars oddly reminiscent of those found on apexes. Thus, Hojo concluded, the region must be home to some kind of powerful wind dragon, one whose periodic activity starts a chain reaction that causes the rampage. Animated by this hypothesis, the villagers got to work scouring both the surrounding lands as well as their historic records for any clues about this wind dragon. Meanwhile, I retreated into my room, where I began writing this entry. My mind was swirling, not with images of a draconic wind god, nor with the memory of the apex in Ogre's golden thunder. No, my mind was filled with... confusion. Why did I feel so compelled to help the villagers with this mystery? Why did I talk and talk and talk in that meeting 
like some novice desperate for praise. And why, why could I not get that image out of my head? The image of Utsushi looking at me with that expression. I had seen bloodshed and violence in my time, and nothing had seared itself into my mind quite like the sight of a friendly, kind man looking at me with obvious disappointment. As I sit here, dear journal, I think I have found the name of the feeling that's currently burning in my chest. I don't quite know what it means, and I really don't want to admit it is what I think it is. But I will not be able to sleep if I don't admit it. So here's the deal. I will write down its name, and then immediately go to sleep. That way it's out, without any extra pondering. Deal? Deal. Shame. What I am feeling now is shame. It's very late, and somehow I do not think I'll be sleeping tonight. My mind feels like it's about to burst, so I hope writing the events of the last few days down will help. Oh, God, I hope so. Shortly after our encounter with the Apex, an ancient text was uncovered by one of the villagers that gave us the information we needed. This old book, one careless breath away from turning to dust, mentioned the existence of something that the native tongue called Tengokuryo. Roughly translated, it spoke of celestial serpents, elder dragons that rode the storms, whose very life caused calamity around them. As far as leads go for the source of the rampage, this was our best bet. Scouring the archives and relic texts further, now looking specifically for the characters that denote the Tengo Kuryu, we were able to produce a decent outline of what these creatures are and how they live. The celestial serpents seem to be a species of elder dragon that migrate around the lower atmosphere, using their command over wind and thunder. Their presence brings catastrophic storms, and they are generally depicted as aggressive and wrathful. Their movements are also hard to track. But, thanks to the village pulling together to study countless relic texts, one regularity in their behavior was indeed discovered. Numerous, independent accounts speak of an ancient island covered in ruins and water trees that has long since besieged by the serpents, serving as their nest across the eons. Initially, this clue didn't really help much. A ruined island? That could be anywhere. And what the hell are water trees? Luckily, we didn't have to ponder long. Utsushi, who had traveled far and wide during his many recon missions, remarked the description might suggest the Coral Palace. Before I could ask for more details, Fugen paired me up with Utsushi once more and asked us to investigate that place. I was only filled in on the way. The Coral Palace was a bizarre island that is said to have emerged from the sea out of nowhere. It is covered in land corals, which grow to enormous sizes and form entire coral forests completely outside of the water. They aren't very common. I believe they also occur on one spot on the New World, and are what Utsushi believes is meant in the relic texts when they refer to water trees. The Coral Palace is also covered in ruins. Some kind of civilization lived there once, building heavy fortifications to defend itself from some unknown threat. All in all, it fit the descriptions in the relic texts perfectly. As our little boat approached the Coral Palace, both of us wordlessly realized that Utsushi's hunch had been correct. The air around the area was still, not in a natural way, but as if someone had simply turned off all of the wind. It was as if we were suspended 
in the held breath of a gargantuan beast. We docked on the grey, rocky coast and began making our way through the palace. It was an otherworldly place. The ruins seemed quite similar in architecture to the buildings in Kamura, but they were cracked, broken, and entirely reclaimed by the forests of the deep ocean, dragged to the surface in what felt like a heretic display. And all throughout, the air was perfectly still. It felt suffocating. Before long, however, we sighted our target. High above the ruined city, we spotted a blue shade hovering through the wispy clouds. It seemed to be swirling in mist. That was one of the serpents. We were sure of it. Utsushi signaled me towards one of the ruined armaments. I understood immediately. Swiftly, I hopped over to the battle station and gave a thumbs up to confirm that yes, at least one of the ballistae was still operational. Utsushi and I then took our time sharpening our weapons and drinking our elixirs. The serpent was idly circling above us, seemingly not going anywhere. After we had both finished our preparations, I mounted the ballista, took a deep breath, and fired at the creature. I knew I had hit my target without having to see the shot collide with it. Moments after I had pulled the trigger, the still air around us awoke with thundering rage as winds surged towards and around us at dizzying speeds. We had made ourselves known, and now we would suffer the consequences. The serpent descended onto us, its features becoming more visible as it did so. Its shell was a deep blue, and multiple veil-like membranes drifted off its body. Its hind legs were essentially vestigial, while its front limbs were well-developed, ending in sharp claws. Its head was a grotesque visage, its humongous lower jaw open to reveal a second set of jaws inside of its mouth, while its head was crowned with bizarre, rod-shaped horns. Its bright yellow eyes seemed to look through us, and all across its body, weird pulsating growths sat in unknown purpose. From what the relic text had alluded to, this must have been the male of the species, generally referred to as Ibushi. The winds intensified as the creature approached, and before long, we were batted around by powerful squalls at the dragon's behest. I was struggling to stand my ground, but nonetheless, we engaged the Ibushi. As my sword slashed through the gale, my mind was surprisingly calm. Just a few days before, I had felt agitated, ashamed, confused. But here, in the heat of battle, that was all washed away. Perhaps that is why I rush headfirst into these conflicts an excuse to turn off my brain and escape whatever troubles me. But I could feel at this time, something was different. As I flew into and around the various wind currents the Ibushi produced, I wasn't just an animal of instinct. My mind was there, clear and unburdened by doubt. Somehow, something had filled me with peace. Ibushi was a true force of nature. It never touched the ground, making combat exceedingly difficult, and its winds could easily redirect our attacks. Even Utsushi's mastery of the Kamura wirebug technique couldn't easily navigate this hurricane. Not to mention that within these winds, the beast itself could fly around without any trouble, which it did to try and kill us with its jaws and claws. Moreover, some of its wind currents carried with them a dark red particle energy, small infusions of the dragon element many elder dragons possess. These currents posed a new issue. Getting caught in them would essentially be the end of us. At one point, the Ibushi roared in a peculiar tone, before curling up and levitating further into the sky. Suddenly, the winds began violently flowing upwards, ripping rocks and debris right out of the ground and causing them to orbit the Ibushi rapidly. 
We both knew that whatever came next would be bad. However, at the same time, hope presented itself. The upward winds had not just pulled up rocks, but also uncovered some fortifications that had been submerged before. Just at a glance, I spotted one ballista and one cannon that looked crooked but functional. Without having to communicate, as if connected by some invisible bond of experience and intuition, Utsushi and I nodded at each other and zipped over to our positions. I went to the ballista while Utsushi manned the cannon. As we had silently suspected, once enough rocks had gathered around the dragon, it violently expulsed them outwards, a massive explosion that sent meteors flying in every direction. Our plan was now set up for success. Utsushi used the cannon to destroy the rocks that were flying for us, while I focused my senses to try and get a clean shot on the beast itself. But how could I make the maximum impact? One ballista shot would not kill it, so I had to somehow ground it such that we could then move in for the kill. How does one pin down a floating elder dragon? In a cold sweat, my eyes darted around the creature until I saw my opportunity. Tranquility washed over me as I loaded my ballista. My eyes were fixated on one of the pulsating orbs on the Ibushi's body. My vision focused, solely looking at how the wind currents that were keeping the dragon airborne seemed to pass through that organ. An air sac. With a thundering shriek, I released my ballista bolt and within an instant, I knew my instincts had once again served me well. The ibushi whined and yelped as the winds around it grew weaker and its body began shaking with pained instability. Without wasting a moment, I released another shot, hitting a second air sac. The dragon plummeted to the ground, as all the winds around it were reduced to jittery breezes. The thwomp of its slam into the ground was our signal, as both Utsushi and I leapt from our armaments and immediately began slashing away at the monster's remaining air sacs. The inconsistent wind speeds imply that, should he have time to recover, the Ibushi might be able to take off again even with the two burst air sacs I inflicted on him. So, we both instinctually decided that the best course of action would be to rip apart its remaining air sacs to prevent it from levitating again. We could worry about killing it later. As we had almost destroyed all of the Ibushi's air sacs, its sounds changed. Instead of pained groaning, it began to sing? A melodic roar erupted from its throat before it suddenly fell silent, its eyes glazing over and losing their color. It seemed like we had won, but something didn't feel right. The wind had weakened, but not subsided, and the sky had begun to darken. Utsushi looked at me quizaciously, and before I could even think of a reply, the clouds were split apart by thunder and lightning. And among the roaring storm, another sound emerged. The bellowing screams of an elder dragon. Through the parting clouds, a figure appeared. It was similar in shape to the Ibushi, but its shell was a bright yellow, and its horns were more like those of a regular wyvern. It did, however, also have a mane of orange, coral-like filaments running down its entire spine. Every time it roared, lightning struck. Exhausted, me and Utsushi realized that this was the other celestial serpent described in the text. Narwa, the female of the species. I sighed and threw Utsushi a tired look. One serpent had been a struggle. Guess we now have to deal with a second one. As Narwa approached, various rocks and debris floated up around her, similarly to how it had with Ibushi. Its body was crackling with electricity, and I could feel myself get slightly lifted by the creature's mysterious pull. I took a deep breath, readied myself, and a horrid scream echoed through the palace. Startled, we turned around to see Ibushi, Awake but on the brink of death, 
lifting itself up using Narwa's pull. His air sacs were torn, and yet he still squirmed and struggled to push air through them, trying desperately to take to the air. His skin tearing, his eyes bloodshot, Ibushi succeeded. He levitated. Using the last of his strength, the dragon barreled towards us, at us, past us. Like a firework missile, the elder dragon flew directly to Narwa, latching onto her with his claws and she onto him. For a moment, they simply floated in that embrace, roaring in unison, performing an unknown song. But it was not just sound that was entering my head. Faintly, my heart was filled with emotions and sensations not my own. Were these dragons, these animals, transferring some sort of emotional signal to us? Perhaps unintentionally, a byproduct of this bizarre ritual? Either way, I was overwhelmed by what was entering my mind. The feelings of a mere animal should be little more than simple sensory experiences, but this was something else. My heart was filled with despair, grit, determination, but also hope. Hope for the future, love for each other, hope and love, which I also held for their descendants. The dragon pair erupted into a blinding flash of light, and both Utsushi and I were blasted away by a shockwave. The next thing I remember is waking up surrounded by rubble. The explosion had destroyed the ground on which we had stood earlier, causing a cave-in. We now lay in a wide pit, where many old fortifications still sat half-buried. I looked around swiftly and saw that Utsushi was fine, if a little bruised. Near us lay Ibushi. All life had left him, his earlier flight having extinguished the last of his energy. And above us, descending into the cavern was Narwa, or at least, what had been Narwa mere moments ago. Now, she looked similar, yet changed. Her orange mane now pulsated with a deep purple light, and her shell had darkened. But most shockingly, her abdomen now held numerous glowing orbs, gently alighting with the essence of both Ibushi and Narwa. The worst case scenario had come to be. Ibushi, in his final moments, had successfully mated with Narwa, giving her not just his seed, but his very life force, empowering her and entrusting her with the future of their kin. This Narwa was no longer merely a dragon. She was a mother protecting her young. My mind wandered to a word I had seen in the relic texts. All Mother. It seemed appropriate here. The All Mother looked over to her dead partner. A soft, purring sound escaped her throat. Then, she exhaled and turned to us. A moment later, all hell broke loose. Imbued with the raging desire to protect her family, command over thunder and dominion over the storm, All Mother Narwa was wrath incarnate. Lightning danced around her as her swirling movement sent out waves of wind and thunder. I just barely dodged it all, every movement followed by the next. There was no time to think or even breathe. Glancing around, I saw that Utsushi was in the same predicament. This was simply not sustainable. Her power even seemed to be growing. Before long, the All Mother began lifting up fortifications from the ground and using them against us. Ballastae, cannons, even Dragonators. The power of a Celestial Serpent was all crushing. And she was going to give birth to a whole clutch of equally powerful dragons? I was overcome with a sense of duty. Even if we couldn't slay Narwa, we could not let her leave with her children intact. A single one could create countless calamities. They simply could not be allowed to be born. If I couldn't kill the All Mother, I had to at the very least destroy her stomach. The first thing you learn when handling any weapon is to keep your eyes open. 
People have a natural instinct to close their eyes when they anticipate a collision or confrontation, a flinching reaction meant to protect the vulnerable eyeballs. But closed eyes cannot effectively guide a weapon. Even if you could hit your target with your eyes closed, I think I could, your strikes will be weak and you'll struggle reacting to any follow-ups. I thought of this lesson as I sprinted past Narwa's various attacks, my eyes wide open, fixated on the eggs in her abdomen. I had seen my target, and now I simply had to hunt it. Electric rings, explosions, winds, none of them could stop me as I weaved my way towards the dragon. Realizing that I was running at her, Nara concentrated her attacks on me, lashing me with lasers and orbs of pure plasma. I dodged and dodged and dodged. Eventually, they did catch me, because I let them. She created a gust of wind right under me, probably to sweep me away. But instead, I used the sudden lift to jump forward and leap directly at her, her eyes widening in shock. With a grunt, I plunged my blade deep into her stomach, twisting and moving it around to make sure to rupture every single egg. Narwa howled in pain and terror before slumping down to the ground, all levitating objects plummeting back down alongside her. I regained my stance and readied myself for the killing blow. She was injured, but she would quickly recover. I would not get another chance. While her eggs were gone, she still needed to be slain. But as I raised my sword, something felt off. I could see the tension in her muscles, her heartbeat under her skin. She could have gotten up by now, but she hadn't. Then, I saw Narwa's eyes. They were simple circles with a black pupil in the middle, a supremely basic shape. And yet they communicated so much. With one of her claws gently resting on the gaping wound I had inflicted on her stomach, I could see in her eyes all that I had sensed when the dragons had embraced. A turbulent mix of rage, despair, longing. But now there was more. Regret, hopelessness, and resignation. She had given everything she had for her children. Her partner had sacrificed himself, and it had amounted to nothing. She wasn't going to fight back anymore. Never again. I raised my sword further. Confusion and doubt took over me, but I had a job to do. It was the first time my eyes were closed when my blade hit my target. I don't remember much after that. I know we returned to Kamura. I recall being celebrated as a hero, the vanquisher of serpents or whatever. But none of that really mattered. What stuck with me, besides our battle itself, was what Utsushi had told me on our way back. He said to me that he was truly grateful for my help that he had, on numerous occasions during the fight, feared for his life, and that he might not have made it if he hadn't been inspired and supported by a true friend like me. A true friend. Mere days ago, I had shocked and disappointed him so deeply that he could barely look at me. But now, we are brothers in arms. I had done my best, my utmost, to isolate myself, and yet I had still formed a bond with him. And the weirdest part was that I did not mind. It wasn't just men that shocked me today. I have always maintained that monsters are mere animals, creatures of instinct that have little agency, intelligence, or value. I was so sure of it, it cost me my career, and I... I think I still want to believe this. But how can I? How, 
after I saw a mother grieve her unborn young, after I saw a father sacrifice himself for his family. These feelings, these sensations that I had believed to be the privilege of man, this emotional depth, seeing it reflected in those creatures that I had cut down so carelessly, I... This has not helped. This was not a smart idea. I should just go to bed. I should try to sleep. Against all odds. Yeah. I should, yet again, close my eyes. I suppose I should write something down again, even if today was pretty uneventful. The village is in a bit of a frenzy these days. After the slaying of the serpents, many wanted to celebrate the end of Kamura's plight. But some scholars argued that it was too early to relax. The language the relic texts were written in has, apparently, an odd way of using plurals. It can only either say one or multiple. It has no distinct way of expressing a specific number, or rather, whatever way there was has been lost to time. This means that in theory, there could be other species of celestial serpents out there besides the two that we fought. This proposal has inadvertently caused Kamura Village to become exceptionally invested in the study of ancient texts. What other secrets may lie in the relic records? Since I am not a scholar, I was of little help. Occasionally a Kamuran would ask me for my opinion on some ancient sketch, which I would describe as a scrambled onion, to which the researcher would chuckle and walk away. It is actually a little embarrassing how often this exact thing managed to happen. This is why I have been mostly idle today. No. Wait, there was one thing I would like to write down. In the afternoon, activity slowed down in the entire village. The sun starts burning real hot, and essentially everyone decides it's nap time. I was wandering around aimlessly, trying to enjoy the rest period I had been given in recognition of my great victory or whatever, when suddenly a voice called out to me. It was Kagero the local head merchant, who had just made a batch of suki tea and was asking if I would like to join him for some. I had not talked much to him yet, and I can't say I'm a big tea guy, but on the other hand, I didn't really have anything else to do. I walked over to his stand, where a teapot was brewing right next to a fuming maca pot, where the Wyvarian performs the arcane art of melding. Leaning on his little cart, the two of us sipped the sweet tea in silence for a while, before he initiated a conversation. He asked me what I thought of the recent events. Did I feel safer now that the serpents were gone? Or was I also deeply concerned with the possibility of more elder dragons in the region? I took a moment to ponder the question before I answered. Elder dragons are like mosquitoes. No matter how many you swat down, one will always remain, ready to bite you in the backside. I wish they were as rare as the scientists say. Kagero let out a hearty laugh and agreed. He said that in his long life, he had heard so many stories and legends about elder dragons that they sometimes feel more common than bird wyverns. Chuckling, we continued to sip. It was an odd feeling. Here was a refined man, an aged Wyvarian, spending his time with me, a hunter who has, at best, been referred to as a brute. Despite the seeming rift that should have existed between us, here we were, sharing stories and tea on a sunny day. As the conversation went on, I offhandedly mentioned that I was sort of glad that we were able to avenge all the places that had been destroyed by the Celestial Serpents. After all, they had, for example, wiped out all of Tsukito City. Upon hearing this, Kagero... reacted. I could only go off of his body language, as his face was always obscured by his mask. But something about him shifted. 
When he spoke next, he sounded a little stilted. He asked if I was certain that the serpents were the culprits behind the disaster at Tsukito. The question took me by surprise. Every villager had so far mentioned the serpents and Tsukito in the same breath. Being an outsider, I had just kind of assumed that them being responsible was a foregone conclusion. I told Kagero as much, and after a short silence, he responded. In the north, he said, there lie the Yukumo Mountains, the Misty Peaks. Those windswept mountains reach high into the sky, and many of its summits remain unexplored. That region is rife with legends of floating elder dragons, capable of wielding the wind. Kagero was clearly trying to sound neutral, but a hint of venom still slipped through his composure. He concluded by pondering if maybe there are other dragons yet out there, and if the destroyer of Tsukito might be among them. Kagero excused himself, saying that the sun was getting to him. With a hurried goodbye, he carted his shop away, leaving me to wonder what just happened. Even now, hours later, writing down the events as I remember them, his sudden shift seems weird. Does he know something about Tsukito that I don't? Either way, I was just glad to be able to talk to someone. Weird feeling, but not unpleasant. Not unpleasant at all. A few days after my talk with Kagero, the village erupted into commotion. The villagers were all gathered in the town square, all yelling and talking over each other. I had just woken up, so I drowsily walked my way over to figure out what was going on. Fugen calmed the masses and, with a regretful tone in his voice, explained the situation. In the early hours of the morning, a message had arrived by Kahoot. Another elder dragon had been spotted near the Infernal Springs. The dragon in question had been confirmed to be an Amatsu, a very old and well-documented creature. While its exact phylogenetic relation to the celestial serpents is unknown, it is similar to them in that it commands the storms as it floats across the skies. As it is usually found further north, near Yukumo, Fugen had already requested aid from the reclusive mountain village, as their experience with the dragon would surely help in driving it away. This was only part of the issue, however. Shortly after this message was received, Kagero the Merchant had gone missing. He had vanished, leaving behind only a letter, which was now being passed around. Shocked, I tried not to think too much, until the letter finally passed to me and its words unraveled before my eyes. My dearest friends, these past years have felt like a dream. Your bottomless kindness and unyielding loyalty to one another has moved me in ways I thought lost to me. So, I believe I owe you the truth, now, at the end of the road. You know me as Kagero the Merchant. I sell you goods, you ask if you can look under my mask, I tell you no in the politest way possible. But what many of you may not know is how I came to be in Kamura. Years ago, I arrived at the village gate, soaked in rain and blood, clutching a babe in my arms, begging for asylum. I was ready to be turned away. You didn't. I was prepared to have to explain and justify myself. I didn't have to. I dreaded that the young child I carried would be scorned and mistreated as an outsider. She wasn't. In all these years, you have never, not once, treated me as a stranger. My heart aches with joy every time I remember that. But I too had a life before that moment. I, Kagero, was once the chief advisor of the royal family of Tsukito. I was their closest friend and I loved them dearly. I was also entrusted with raising their daughter, a wonderful child with a bright future. But then, the calamity struck. 
the elder dragon Amatsu swept through Tsukito City, and within just a few hours, what had once been my home turned into a smoldering wasteland. In her final breath, the queen of Tsukito handed me her child, asking me to protect her until my dying day. I ran and ran, child in hand, until I arrived at the gates of Kamura. From that day on, I was simply Kagero the merchant, and the young girl grew into the renowned village cook, Yamogi. It should have been enough to merely survive. And were I a stronger man, it would have been. But now, Amatsu has returned, and I cannot look away. I watched its winds tear apart those that I loved. I heard its thunder drown out the screams of my family. I witnessed its storm sweep away all that I was and all I held dear. My soul wishes to move on, but every fiber of my being is screaming in rage. I cannot look away. I cannot turn my back. And so, I must bid you farewell. I will face Amatsu, and I will vanquish it. I will also, most likely, be undone by the dragon. That is fine. This was always how it was going to end. Do not mourn me. You have given me much more than I could have ever asked for. I merely request that you continue to look after Yomogi in my stead. And please, should you ever find a time on a cool summer night, burn some incense for the lost city of Tsukito. Remember the silent dead, the charred and anguished souls. And perhaps, think of the faceless Wyvarian, whose anger led him into the eye of the storm. Forever yours, and forever in your debt, Kagero, last guardian of Tsukito. Needless to say, within less than an hour, Utsushi and I were already on our way to the Infernal Springs. There wasn't anything to say, no justification worth uttering. Our friend was in danger, and we were going to help him. Fugen had already assured us that help from Yukuma would arrive shortly, so all we had to do was find and secure Kagero and then stand our ground until reinforcements could join in. Would that be enough? Who knew? As we were carted into the deep red valley where the springs lay, I frantically read up on what the guild knew about Amatsu. Most accounts were pretty lackluster, simply describing it as strong and overwhelming. Not helpful. One report mentioned that a hunter was able to confirm the existence of the Storm Vesicle, a legendary organ that is said to grant the Amatsu its dominion over the storm. Apparently, that hunter claims to have sighted such a structure on the creature's chest. Another, much shorter report briefly explained that the Zenogar seemed to have a sort of predisposed grudge against Amatsu, likely a result of generations of territory disputes. Doubt that would be useful, I remember thinking. Before long, we arrived at the springs. This abandoned valley was infamous for its hellish landscape, a scattered wasteland of old ruins and crimson waterfalls. It is said that the peculiar color of the water in the area is a result of centuries of bloodshed and suffering. What this place actually was once, no one seems to know. Kamura's elders do seem to tense up whenever the topic is mentioned, however. As we surveyed the area, it became clear that we were at the right location. The weather in this valley wasn't known to be pleasant, but it seemed particularly violent right then. Winds battered the ruins and rain torrented down into the agitated waters. The clouds above us raced across the skies at unnatural speeds, all towards a single point. The Eye of the Storm. As we hurried towards the center of the tempest, we sighted a shadowy figure soaring within the clouds. It was too distant to make out, but we both knew instinctively that that was the culprit. We didn't pay it much mind quite yet. We were here to rescue Kagero. The exalted Lord of the Storm would have to wait his turn. Our search didn't take long. On a cliff, Close to where the beast hovered, a small figure stood, shaking like a leaf. 
Utsushi and I ran to it, finding it to be Kagero, battered and bruised, his blade and mask broken. Luckily, he was still breathing. Utsushi readied the cart so that we may bring Kagero back to the village, when suddenly the storm intensified. Thunder began to crackle, and the figure drifting in the clouds unleashed a deafening roar as it began to descend towards us. It seemed that the Elder Dragon had claimed Kagero as a sort of trophy, one it would not part with easily. With a bark, I instructed the cart felines to hurry and carry Kagero towards Kamura. Utsushi and I braced ourselves to hold off the monster until our friend could be brought to safety. As it exited the clouds, the true form of Amatsu became visible. A huge, snaking mass of fins and whiskers, sails that conquered the winds and summoned the typhoon. On its head, two enormous horns crowned it the true king of the skies. Its winds and thunder felt different than those produced by the celestial serpents. Ibushi and Narwa seemed to me like hapless imitators, whose memory paled in the face of the genuine article. Fighting Amatsu was much like fighting the atmosphere itself. It moved gracefully, slowly, with no indication which moves and motions actually produced the thunder and wind that assaulted us. The creature simply existed, as the atmosphere around it raged to the tune of its command. Utsushi and I were fighting for our lives, using every sense and intuition we had to avoid being struck by lightning or ripped apart by wind. It was a war of attrition, and one that we were bound to lose. As I dodged and guarded for my life, I saw one thing that could turn the tide of this inferno. Old cannons, half buried but distinctly intact, and maybe even operational. I threw myself at the cannon, manned it in one swift motion and saw, to my delight, that it had been left loaded. As the dragon focused on a nimble Utsushi, I readied my shot. Thinking of the reports I had read earlier, I had a hunch as to what I should aim for. With the words about the mysterious storm vesicle organ reverberating in my mind, I took the shot, firing a cannonball directly into the Amatsu's chest. An explosion erupted right above its heart, and the dragon's awful screams were quickly drowned out by the storm's hastening rage. I sensed the familiar tingle in my hair and immediately jumped away from the cannon, which was obliterated by a lightning strike an instant later. As I regained my footing, I looked in terror upon the result of my bravery. The Amatsu was now enveloped in crackling electricity and torrents of unnatural rain, as it looked down on me directly. I had succeeded only in gaining its wrath. The following seconds were pure hell. My body was burning with the tension that preceded a thunderclap, and my eyes were gashed by the winds that targeted me. Utsushi did his best to take off some of the heat, but even he could not withstand the rage of the storm dragon. All we could do is cling to life desperately, as all of nature, every element, conspired to end us at the behest of this legendary fiend. With my eyes locked onto it, I studied the Amatsu's movement, desperately trying to find anything that could prolong my life. After a short eternity, I saw what I was looking for. The beast pulsated with a regular, rhythmic charge of electricity. Well, almost regular. Around its chest, the pulse was slightly delayed, with sparks that seemed much more violent and sporadic than the even current surrounding the creature. Upon further inspection, I saw that my cannonball had not been entirely fruitless. On the Amatsu's chest, a small wound had formed, and where its protective shell had been broken by the cannonball exploding. At that spot, electricity flowed unevenly, and a fleshy, glowing mass was visible beneath the scales. That must be the storm vesicle, the source of the beast's power. At least, that is what my desperate mind clung to as the elements ravaged Utsushi and me. Before I had time to process the information, a red orb of light shot into the sky, forcing a brief pause in our struggle as even the dragon looked onto it with mild curiosity. Utsushi and I immediately recognized the hunter's signal flare coming from further in the valley. Were reinforcements nearby? Utsushi nodded at me, and I understood in an instant. 
he would go meet the approaching forces halfway to make sure they would find us, so I had to give him cover to rush past the dragon. As my friend ran towards the Amatsu, I plucked a kunai out of my pouch and threw it at the beast. It bounced off its hide impotently, but it succeeded in getting the dragon's attention. As the Amatsu turned towards me in rage, Utsushi disappeared into the valley, leaving me to face the calamity alone for the time being. Easier said than done. Before, the dragon's ire had been divided, but now I had to endure its full brunt. The attacks came in such rapid succession that I feared to even blink. Thunder, water beams, wind slashes. The Amatsu had truly decided to kill me. At one point, it created a gust of wind so powerful that it outright lifted me into the air, where the beast fought to dispatch me effortlessly. If I hadn't clumsily wirebugged away, it indeed would have. Exhausted and not an inch closer to my target, I watched my options dwindle away. In a last-ditch effort, I threw a barrage of kunai directly at Yamatsu's chest, hoping that at least one would hit the exposed vesicle. They were all deflected, either by the beast's hide or the sparks of thunder circulating the vesicle. I slumped onto my knees, my sword arm losing all tension. For as long as I could remember, I had relied on my strength. When others strategized, I turned their ideas into reality using my command of physical power. It was who I was. But now, that strength had failed me. What good were muscles against 1,000 cuts of ravaging wind gales? What use were finely honed reflexes when faced with an enemy that delivers death at the speed of a thunderclap? What hope did I, a mere man, have, even at the peak of my strength, against the Lord of the Storm? My body simply stopped moving. My eyes fell shut. There was nothing left to look out for. My resignation took even the Amatsu by surprise. Hovering slowly towards me, perhaps expecting a trap, the dragon eventually reared up, ready to put an end to my pitiable struggle. A flash of red light erupted once again. A second hunter flare had been fired, this time directly into the Amatsu's face. Dumbfounded at this bizarre turn, I looked around, past the beast shaking off the smoke and fire of the flare, and saw a hunter jump into the fray, wearing baggy pants and a wide conical hat. Two others quickly joined, wearing the same attire. The reinforcements from Yukumo had arrived. The hunters quickly surrounded the still reeling beast, with one of them running up to me to check on my well-being. Stunned, I asked him where Utsushi was. The Yukumoan smiled and simply told me to enjoy the show. The Yukumo hunters were incredibly efficient. The gulf in knowledge about the Amatsu was evident from the very first moments of their attack strategy. All three of them weaved around the dragon's attacks as if in a trance, not counter-attacking, but not struggling either. One after another, the hunters got into position. They had managed to find and erect one ballista each, valuable armaments that me and Utsushi had simply disregarded in our panic. I watched them load unusual ammunition into the ballistae. Binders, long spears with an attached rope, meant to trap large monsters. But how would that work if the dragon's hide deflects all attacks? Before I could shout my concerns, they were obliterated by the Yukumoans' expertise. A brief bark in their native language signaled their assault, as they all simultaneously fired the ballista binders. Instead of aiming for the beast's body, or even its flesh, the binders all flew into the delicate fins of the Amatsu, where they managed to land securely, hooking into the beast and forcing it to descend in pain and rage. Of course, its body may be armored, but the sails it uses to ride the wind obviously couldn't be. With the Amatsu pinned down, strength returned to my limbs once more. The Yukumoans were locked in position holding the binders down, so someone still needed to actually slay the dragon. I stood up, my legs shaking, but my will reformed. I had no idea how I would hurt the creature, 
but I would certainly try. Before I could, however, the Yukumoans erupted in cheers. Following their gaze, I looked upon the roof of a nearby ruin to see Utsushi waving at us enthusiastically while producing a weird howl from his mouth. I wanted to shout a question at him, but he quickly jumped off the roof and was immediately followed by an apex Zenogre. The thundering fanged wyvern roared into the valley. As it scanned its surroundings, it spotted the Amatsu. The natural rivalry between the two species kicked in, and before long, the two monsters only had eyes for each other. They screamed and roared in unison, a thousand years of bitter hate propelling them into each other. As they thrashed, Utsushi came up to me, and I held my friend close. He explained that after meeting the Yukumoans, he had heard the howls of a Zenogar and embarked on a risky strategy, one that was now paying off. The two titans battled ferociously, but it was clear that the Zenogar was losing. Its claws and punches could not penetrate the Amatsu scale armor. Desperately, I pointed at the exposed vesicle in the dragon's chest. We had to somehow get the Zenogar to hit that specific spot. With its claws imbued in electricity, it might just be able to strike a decisive blow. But how does one direct a wild creature into such a precise action, let alone an apex? Just as my mind began to race in despair again, Utsushi grabbed my wrist and explained his plan to me. It was insane. And I was insane for being up for it. We waited for our opening, which came when a particularly violent clash left both Yamatsu and the Zenogar out of breath for just a second. And a second was all we needed. In a single motion, Utsushi and I jumped onto the Zenogar's back. Before the creature had any chance to react, we both unraveled both of our wire bugs to their maximum length, tying the wire around the Zenogar's limbs and neck. By combining our wires and letting them reinforce each other like a braid, we will be able to wrangle even the might of an apex. With great difficulty, we directed the rampaging beasts, its ire enveloping its hide in deadly thunder. Like a marionette player, we moved it towards the enemy. The Amatsu seemed exceedingly confused at what was happening, and so did not evade in time. Roaring in unison, Utsushi and I forced the Zenogar's electrified claw directly into the dragon's exposed vesicle, where it plunged deeply into the spongy organ. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, a terrible current shot through me, and again, I failed to keep my eyes open, as the panic conquered me. Utsushi, however, acting on some kind of hunter's intuition, had already begun to move, grabbing me and lunging off the Zenogar's back in a single motion, and just in time. Laying on the floor, we watched the Amatsu's vesicle explode, sending arcs of plasma and thunder into and around the bodies of both monsters. After a few seconds of horrible howls, the Amatsu fell limp, while the Zenogar, smoldering and charred, managed to just about keep standing. While it licked its wounds, I slowly got back up on my feet and approached the motionless Amatsu. Before I even touched it, I knew it was dead. The Zenogar had only touched the exploding vesicle and had sustained serious injuries already. Having such a thing detonate inside one's body was sure to be certain death. The Amatsu was no more. I gave Utsushi a thumbs up, but we couldn't relax just yet. The Zenogar was injured, but very much still present. I readied my blade, eager to make up for my weakness in the previous fight. The wyvern looked at us intensely, but did not move. Then, a thump. Utsushi had thrown a slab of raw meat from his pouch right in front of the injured beast. The Zenogar inspected the meat cautiously, and then, with a small chirp, picked it up with its maw and immediately ran away, seemingly concerned we would simply steal the treat back again. Looking at how it walked, it probably would not have been able to stand up to us. I lowered my blade, once again closing my eyes. The rest of the day was a blur. 
We parted ways with the Yukumoans, who took one of the Amatsu's horns as a trophy. We took the other horn, schlepping it back to Kamura, where we were greeted by an ecstatic Fugen. Kagero's escort had made it back safely. He would recover in just a few days' time, in fact. Various words were exchanged, but again, nothing stuck in my memory. Nothing except one thing. As the evening drew nearer and it was time to retreat for the night, Utsushi put his hand on my shoulder. We exchanged almost no words. A standard good job and a few other niceties. But I was struck by how meaningful it felt. It was as if our entire bond had been transformed. I thanked him for his aid today and excused myself to my room, where I began writing this. That was hours ago, and I still can't sleep. My mind keeps returning to those awful moments right before help arrived. I had truly, sincerely been on the verge of giving up. I had seen my lifetime of experience, my perfectly honed strength, my very essence be nullified by the sheer might of a single Elder Dragon. All I was, was not enough. It was only with Utsushi's help, the Yukumoans' help, the Zenogers' help, that I was able to prevail. It has become painfully clear to me that I lack something. I lack some kind of true strength, a strength that is only unleashed when others come to help me. I have to find out what this strength is, and how to tap into it on my own. The battles will only get fiercer from here on. Thus... I must, too. Alright, let's try riding a bit. God, I hope this doesn't make me seasick. It's been about three weeks since our battle against Yamatsu. Immediately following this and a few back and forth letters with Guild HQ, both Utsushi and I had been promoted to Master Hunters, meaning we were eligible for hunting assignments from all guild jurisdictions, as well as all levels of presumed danger. Well, for me this was the second time achieving Master Rank, but I was glad to have my fancier guild card back after it had been confiscated during my arrest. The Kahoot carrying our new guild cards also included a letter specifically for and about me. The envelope requested it to be read in the presence of the village elder, so I grabbed Fugen and opened the message. In it, the guild congratulated me on my seemingly well proceeding rehabilitation. The letter however stressed that I still had a long road ahead of me if I wanted my old blade back. In the section addressed to Fugen, the guild expressed that if Kamura had any pending or upcoming collaboration quests, that is to say, large cooperative assignments that recruit hunters from all over the world, that he should consider sending me as Kamura's representative. Forcing me to cooperate with people I don't know should prove adequate training for me, the letter argued. Fugen, upon reading this, looked at me with a concerned glance, but to my own surprise, I didn't mind. Trust me, I wanted to protest. The thought of being forced to work with some rando hunters I had never met before would have greatly offended me not long ago. But now, no matter how hard I tried to dislike it, the thought immediately conjured images of Utsushi and I riding the Apex Zenogre into the Amatsu. Not long ago, Utsushi had been a random nobody to me as well, so with that in mind, I told Fugen as much. Happily, he told me that Kamura was indeed invited to two cooperative missions, one of which would be happening within just a few days. Unaware of what exactly I was signing up for, I happily pledged my cooperation. I was distinctly less happy when, merely two days later, I sat inside a tiny, rotting ship on a journey across the second largest known ocean and towards a continent fewer than a hundred people had ever set foot on. Fugen had, right up until I had boarded the transport, neglected to mention that the assignment was a research expedition into Fonron, the lost continent. Apparently, according to the extremely seasick huntress seated next to me, 
the aim of this assignment was the protection of a band of researchers. Funron was, as most hunters know, a mysterious landmass that was simultaneously entirely devoid of active civilization and yet completely covered in traces of past civilizations. The entire northern half of the continent is essentially one enormous collection of ruins, entire cities and massive towers sitting in total decay, reclaimed by lush green jungles. Funron was, in many ways, the holy grail of research. The fact that our mission was important did not really change my displeasure at being crammed into a floating can. As our journey would be quite long, I made an effort to scout out my prospective teammates. The huntress next to me seemed quite young, and it was probably her first master rank assignment. I made a mental note to keep an eye on her, see if I could help her in any way. Then, an older gunner, who had managed to fall asleep despite the rocky waters. Nothing to worry about here. Lastly, there was the true oddity of this mission, and the person I was most keen on observing. A young man with a thin beard, clad in bizarre armor that no blacksmith in Kamura or Dandorma would ever craft. Next to him lay his weapons, a set of odd dual blades that looked as if they were made of rose thorns. This was, without a shadow of a doubt, a frontier hunter. Frontier hunters are a sub-organization within the Hunters Guild, working out of the Mesoporta city quarter in Dandorma. Their group is deceptively old, and, when the separate guilds of the world came together to form the Grand Hunters Guild during the Great Unification, the frontier hunters of Mesoporta retained a lot more of their culture and habits than many of the other guilds that were absorbed into the Grand Guild. Specifically, frontier hunters specialize in hunting and investigating monsters that only exist in the margins of historical records, creatures that barely anyone even knows about. In order to do that, they wield bizarre weapons and venture into territories uncharted by the guild or any other institution. As such, frontier hunters keep their own records, their own hunter's notes, their own encyclopedia. They are an odd bunch, and while they are technically subservient to the Grand Hunters Guild, they are more so cooperative with them, but act mostly independently. Being a native Dundorman myself, I have seen them many times walking around the city, but those were always just glimpses. Here was an opportunity to see a true Mesoporta warrior in action. I could tell my other teammates thought the same, between the sleeping and the vomiting. Before long, we docked onto the shores of Fonron, on a small makeshift pier. This was the landing zone for research vessels, having been hastily ha assembled not too long ago. The head researcher quickly collected us into a small barrack, where we were briefed on the details of our assignment. The goal of this current research effort was the discovery and recording of a mural said to lie deep within the forlorn city, the largest collection of ruins thus found on Fonron. The mural's existence was supposedly mentioned in a few old texts, and the head scientist, as well as a painter, would endeavor to find it and copy it, such that it may be studied extensively across numerous laboratories. The journey to that mural's approximate location would take one day on foot approximately, and for the duration of that journey, we hunters were tasked with protecting the scientist and the painter. The leader of this operation would be the frontier hunter, as he had been to Fonron before and knew the terrain well. After this brief introduction, we packed our things, readied our supplies, and began our journey not even two hours after docking. Trekking through the thick forests of Fonron after a long ship journey was not my idea of relaxation, but I knew better than to complain. I was here to learn to cooperate, after all. I didn't really take any notes during the quiet part of the mission, as I instead focused on socializing. My partners, who all kindly asked me not to record their names here, were a pleasant bunch. The old gunner showed us etchings he had made of his young granddaughter. Ugly little thing, but I didn't tell him that. He hoped that she wouldn't follow in his footsteps and instead take on a more peaceful profession. The huntress, meanwhile, was a lot spunkier on land than she had been on the sea, jumping at the slightest noise, ready to prove herself. 
yet it was not mere youthful vigor, as her words and tales of her hunts were doused in the tones of genuine awe and passion. The quietest of the group was our leader, the frontier hunter. He was kind and friendly, but he did not speak much. Perhaps his duty as guide and protector weighed on him. The journey went without any troubles until we reached the forlorn city itself. Emerging out from the thick forest, the sight of ruins stretching across the entire horizon was quite spectacular. What was less so was the sight of a trembling, snoring brown mass stretched out right in the middle of our path. I had never seen a wyvern like this before, covered in large orange spikes and thorns. Paying my confusion little mind, I readied my blade to wake up the beast. After all, it was in the way, and due to the ruins, there was no easy way to circumnavigate it. But the frontier hunter stopped me, and quickly offered us all a brief explanation. This was a flaming espinas, he whispered. A monster that is well known to Mezaporta. According to him, there's almost nothing that can penetrate the hide of a resting espinas. My sword would just bounce right off. The trick is to annoy the beast, such that the increased blood flow softens its hide, and then striking a decisive blow. We were all also warned of the creature's terrible flame breath, which produces poisonous vapors as well as splashes of corrosive acid. Truly an awful beast. Armed with this knowledge, we prepared our move. We instructed the scientist and the painter to stay back, while the four of us quietly and carefully began placing barrel bombs near the flaming Espinas' head. Once we had sufficiently rigged the wyvern with explosives, we all took cover as the old gunner detonated the bombs from afar. With an awful screech, the beast awoke, furious at the disturbance. The explosion may not have actually hurt it, but its shockwave and loud sound must have at least been extremely irritating. And indeed, the flaming espinas seemed irritated. The brown beast immediately charged us, its massive horn ready to impale us for our insolence. We did our best to dodge and continue our assault of annoyance. Stun bombs, sound bombs, pellet clusters, the whole menu of annoying tools and weapons. As its ire grew, the flaming espinas began peppering the area with its terrible fireballs, threatening to engulf us in purple poison smoke. Luckily, my wide sword allowed me to fan the fumes away from us rapidly. Its inability to hit us visibly frustrated the wyvern, until its veins became visible through its trembling skin. I wanted to call out and announce our opportunity when suddenly a flash of light passed by me. The frontier hunter had not hesitated for even an instant, barreling towards the beast using speed and movements I had never seen before. The unique combat style of Mesoporta. As if propelled by an invisible wind, a dancer of the gale, the frontier hunter soared towards the flaming espinas and struck it down with a single blow. The beast's softened hide cracked under the sheer power of the hunter's dual blades, and with a loud thump, the flaming espinas fell limp. We did not stop to celebrate our victory much. The frontier hunter carved a few materials from the espinas, but after that, it was high time to resume our journey. Night was approaching quickly. In fact, before we knew it, darkness enveloped us. Seeing the ancient ruins under the pale moonlight was one of those experiences I don't think I'll ever forget. The cold shimmer of the night shining upon what once was a thriving civilization. It had a strange melancholy to it. To those that had lived in it, this city must have seemed eternal, just as Dandorma once seemed eternal to me. And yet, time came for all, eventually. Suddenly, the frontier hunter signaled us to stop. There was no visible threat around, and yet the tension in his body language was palpable. He was hectically looking around, as well as glancing at the massive full moon and swearing. He barked at us to get into defensive positions, which we did with ample confusion. There was nothing there. Except there was. As we stood there in tense silence, we could hear it. A soft, rumbling breath, as well as gentle, careful steps. The rarely heard sounds of an ambush predator. From the direction of the sound, it was clear that this thing was encircling us. I had a hunch on what it could be. 
This hunch was soon confirmed, as a few clouds moved in front of the moon, blocking its faint light. As the moonlight faded, a blurry figure became visible, a large flying wyvern. A Nargakuga. Running into a Nargakuga here was not particularly surprising. The entire genus is believed to have originated in Funron after all, and as such, the continent is known to have an immense variety of Nargakuga breeds and species. Unfortunately, we had encountered the most problematic kind. A lucent Nargakuga, a rare species covered in specialized fur that allows it to bend moonlight to become invisible. Once out of sight, it awaits the perfect opportunity to strike with its poisonous tail barbs. And it seemed that this individual had chosen us as its prey. Even as its form was revealed in the moonlight, it stood perfectly still. After all, it knew that it only had to wait for the clouds to move past the moon, and we'd be helpless against its invisible attacks. Sweat accumulated atop my brow. This battle would be over in the blink of an eye. The moonlight shone once again, the Narakuga vanished, and within an instant, a terrible force swept us all off our feet. Landing on my back a few meters away, I quickly got up and surveyed the situation. The painter and the scientist were unharmed, as the attack had hit the defensive line directly. The gunner and the hunters were both hurt, but conscious. Meanwhile, the frontier hunter had been fully knocked out. Luckily, no one seemed to have been hit by any poison barbs. The dust that had been swept up by the attack gave me a distorted but consistent indication of where the Nargakuga currently stood, as the dirt catching onto its fur betrayed its location. It was currently preparing another attack, directed at the scientist. We were hunters clad in sophisticated armor, so we had survived one direct hit. The two civilians, however, would likely be turned into red paste if even a single attack connected. Instinctively, my hunter's experience kicked in as I reached into my pouch. Nargakuga of all species share one character trait. They all despise loud noises. Being disturbed by a loud enough sound will enrage a Nargakuga and cause it to single-mindedly chase down and destroy the source of it. With that in mind, I grabbed a sound bomb and, instead of throwing it, crushed it directly in my hand. The shrill sonar explosion hurt my ears, but not nearly as much as it infuriated the lucent Nargakuga. The dust cloud erupted explosively as the invisible predator rushed towards me. Counting the now careless steps that I heard advancing upon me, I grasped my sword, bomb shard still embedded painfully in my hand. Three more steps and it would be upon me. Two more steps. One more step. And strike! Using my intuition to time it, I slashed downwards with my sword into seeming nothingness, putting all my weight into an attack that could just as easily miss. But it did not. As my sword descended, it suddenly got stuck in thin air. The characteristic sound of a splitting skull was followed by a pained howl, bookended by a loud thud as the still invisible Nargakuga fell to the ground, dead, with my blade stuck in its head. There were no more incidents after our encounter with the lucid Nargakuga. The frontier hunter quickly came to me and profusely thanked me for handling the situation. The wounds on my hand, as well as those sustained by the gunner and the hunters, were quickly bandaged up as we resumed the final leg of our journey. Before long, we arrived at our destination. A large ruined structure, not notably different than many of the others littered around the area. The scientist and the painter, however, immediately jumped for joy as they ran into the building, where they indeed found the mural they had been looking for. Eagerly, the painter began to work on his reconstruction of the discovery, while the scientist began measuring the indents and engraving. An odd thing happened to me as well. I had seen ancient scriptures and sculptures before. I had worked in the Tarosu region for a while, which was quite full of the stuff. But something about this mural felt different. Without really knowing why, I quickly scribbled a sketch of it into my notebook. For some reason, I felt that I would want to look at it again later. 
the way back was equally as uneventful. Perhaps the fauna of this area had seen us dispatch two of its most fearsome predators and decided that messing with us was simply not worth the hassle. And so, we soon arrived back at the pier, where the head scientist thanked us for our service and released us from duty. To my surprise, a letter had arrived for me again. Fugen was instructing me and the captain of my homeward vessel to not return to Kamura directly, but to instead journey to Elgado, a small outpost of the Greater Kingdom, where the second cooperative mission I had been signed up for would take place. I resigned myself to another exhausting assignment and began boarding my ship when the frontier hunter approached me. He thanked me again for how I handled the lucent Nargakuga while he was knocked out, and gave me a gift as a token of his gratitude. A vial of flaming espinas sulfur. He had carved it off the individual he had slain, and it had many uses in blacksmithing and medicine. It was quite rare on the main continent, so he hoped that it would prove useful to me. I thanked him for the gift, shook his hand, and took to the sea. As the waves shake me gently, I reflect now on these past days. I do not feel nearly as close to these three companions as I do to, say, Utsushi. And yet the brief time we had has been supremely pleasant. I even got to regain some of my confidence during my encounter with the loosened wyvern. Perhaps I truly am changing. But I feel like I cannot give this topic the attention it deserves, because another thought is gnawing at me. I simply can't get the image of the mural out of my head. I keep looking at the sketch I made of it, mesmerized by it despite how terrible my artistry is. The only truly recognizable part of the mural were two flying wyvern, positioned in prayer or panic. Beyond these two figures, the mural gets increasingly bizarre. At the feet of the wyvern, a hole is depicted, a gaping circle of darkness. And out of that chasm seem to emerge… angels? Whatever they are, they seem to come in swarms, with two of them seemingly attaching themselves to the wyvern. Above all of them soars another angel, enormous in size, all enveloping. This image means nothing to me, I cannot find any meaning in it, and yet it is magnetic. I cannot help but find my eyes fixated on the weird winged creatures this mural depicts. Oh, journal, oh man, where to even begin? It is very late, and I am, once again, stuck within my thoughts. After my adventure in Fonron, I was immediately shipped off to another location, Elgado. This is not a town, but a military outpost of the Greater Kingdom, a sovereign nation that only rarely interacts with the Hunter's Guild. They maintain their own standing army of Kingdom Knights, and as such don't tend to hire the help of Hunters. That is why this cooperative mission was so important. Apparently, a threat had presented itself that was too much even for the greatest knights of the kingdom. Some hunters had already joined the effort, but a handful of them had suddenly fallen ill recently. Hence, I was enlisted to help. This operation would become the backbone for furthering relations between the Hunters Guild and the kingdom. Arriving in Elgado felt like returning to a distant memory. Most of my hunting career had taken place in Dandorma, an organized hunter's city, and so I felt right at home among the ration posts, training yards, and command centers. It did feel weird, however, after such a long stay in the much more homely and rural Kamura. Elgado was built into a massive castle ruin, sat atop a rocky island near the eastern shore of the continent. Upon docking, I was immediately directed towards the central castle, where other enlisted hunters had lined up, ready to be briefed. The commanding admiral of Elgado was a man named Gallius, broad and stern, the poster image of military authority. He was joined by, well, the exact opposite. A relaxed Wyvarian wearing baggy trousers and dirty robes, as well as research goggles. 
the head scientist of Elgado, Bahari. Through a duet of serious orders by the Admiral and lively interruptions by the scientist, we eventually managed to get a clear picture of what we were dealing with. About 50 years ago, an elder dragon named Malzino devastated a nearby settlement that was under jurisdiction of the kingdom. It had not been sighted since that incident, until now. Malzino had returned to the area, and it now fell onto the kingdom to slay the beast. Our job as hunters was to offer support to the strongest knight the kingdom had to offer, with whom we would rendezvous on site. That part was quite surprising to me. I hadn't expected us to simply be back up. Without much complaining, we stocked up on supplies and ventured out into the citadel area where the elder dragon had been spotted. The ruined castle town was visible even from afar. As we arrived at the rendezvous point, we were greeted by the pride of the kingdom, Dame Fiorain, the peerless knight warrior. I was surprised by how friendly she was. When one hears of a warrior so fierce that their name is invoked as a monster repellent, one imagines silent legends, stoic war heroes. But no, Fiorain was kind and mild-mannered, explaining the situation concisely and listening to her questions and concerns attentively. The plan was as follows. The Malzino was, at the time, strutting around the castle grounds, seemingly unaware of our presence. Fiorain was certain that she could slay the dragon, but she needed us to counter the Malzino's secret weapon. According to records from the attack 50 years ago, the dragon can move at impossible speeds, so quickly that it seemingly vanishes. However, those are bursts of speed. It cannot keep that speed up, and it seems to need a target to burst towards. By forming a perimeter of warriors around the beast, we were to limit its movements and direct it towards Dame Fiorain, who would be able to vanquish it. An insane plan, but Fiorain's demeanor inspired confidence in all of us, including me. We all got into position. I drew my greatsword and waited for a signal to be fired. Without much delay, I heard the beasts roar and jumped out of my hiding spot, taking my spot on the perimeter. The Malzino was a terrifying creature. Pale silver scales and golden horns contrasted with the crimson webbing of his hood and wings. But most notable were the pulsating red masses on its neck and arms, bizarre growths that seemed to flutter with a life of their own. Their wriggling screeches mixed with the Malzino's own bizarre vocalizations into a cacophony of death. After the initial warning roar, the creature eyed us for a moment, scouting out the situation and realizing that it was surrounded. Then, a horrid sound echoed through the citadel, like a mix between a metal clang and a small explosion. I had merely blinked, and the hunter who had stood a few meters besides me had been transformed into an unrecognizable meth of blood and viscera. I could barely make out what had once been the armor that was supposed to protect him from harm, shredded apart by some profane force. There was no time to react. The sound erupted again, and this time the targeted hunter managed to just intercept the deadly blow, as the Malzino's approach was halted by the gunlancer's shield. Enraged at the resistance it was facing, the Malzino flailed around violently, using its trident tail as a horrible spear. In the scuffle, it began gaining speed again, and before long, the sound returned, as the creature appeared right before me. I hadn't even begun to process its abilities and speed, and yet here it was, ready to strike me down. Time slowed as my senses sharpened, ready to defend myself. But something was wrong. I could see it in the Malzino's movement, and in mine. A feeling crept up to me, something I had not felt since facing the Amatsu. Years upon years of experience and intuition crunched the numbers, calculated every possible move, considered all variables in a fraction of a second, and it all returned the same result. I could not do it. I did not have the speed nor the strength to survive this attack. Unlike last time, I did not fall apart. No, what happened instead was 
is much more frightening in hindsight. I accepted. I simply closed my eyes. No reason to watch myself die. Except I didn't. Metal scraped and I was pushed back onto the ground, but I was distinctly still alive. Confused, I opened my eyes to see Dame Fiorain standing before me, having deflected the dragon. She threw me a quick glance of concern before engaging the beast. Calling her fierce would be an acantor-sized understatement. Her movements were graceful, yet decisive, and she propelled herself forwards at speeds I couldn't even fathom. Her battle against the Malzino was a performance with few equals. As I watched her, I thought that the gulf in strength between her and her enemy was likely much smaller than that between her and me. As I got up back into position, I joined the other hunters in watching the fight, awestruck at the kingdom's finest. No attack went uncountered, no opening unexploited. Before long, the Malzino was on the defensive, losing ground to this force of nature given flesh. Fiore nodded at us between attacks, reminding us to stand at the ready should the creature try to accelerate into thin air again. She may be the vanguard, but we were her safety net. The creature attempted to speed up a few more times, but each time one of the surrounding hunters managed to interrupt its assault and force it back forwards towards Fiorain, who'd immediately continue her onslaught. I did my best to be ready for the Malzino to approach me again, but deep in my bones I knew the outcome would not be different. My knees were shaking gently, and my gaze shifted nervously. I had become a burden, a liability, and a heavy thud echoed through the citadel. Before I had even finished my thoughts, I saw the Malzino fall, struck down by Fiorain's rapier. It had not been a climactic finisher. She had won, clean and simple. The other hunters were just as dumbstruck as me, and it took a solid few seconds before everyone erupted in cheers. As the squad ran up to Fiorain to celebrate her, I stayed behind a little, feeling multiple variations of... Not great. Due to this, I might have been the only one to see the Malzino's corpse do one last puzzling thing. The red growths on its body had not stopped wriggling. Instead, they grew a bit before detaching themselves from the beast, revealing themselves to be wispy, bat-like creatures. As they flew away, I couldn't help but feel that they looked familiar. After the Malzino had been slain, Elgato alighted in festivities. Ale flowed aplenty, and the feline cooks of the castle outdid themselves with their roasts and mashes. It was, all around, a jolly night. Everyone was out and about having fun. Except for me, of course. Surrounded by merriment, I sipped my ale by myself, unable to pry myself from the images of the battle. As the evening had progressed, a few knights and workers of Elgado had come up to me and thanked me for my help in the fight. I didn't really have the heart to admit to them, and maybe myself, that I had essentially done nothing. I kept thinking back to that moment. When the Malzino attacked me, I had instinctively known that there was nothing I could do to equal it. But I had actually felt that exact feeling one more time during the mission, when I saw Fiorain. Over the years, I thought I had become pretty good at judging myself and my peers. I would see a fellow hunter perform a new move and immediately begin thinking on how I could do it too, how to twist my body and tense my muscles to get the same result. But looking upon her, I felt truly outclassed. I saw moves and skills that I could never imagine myself replicating. My head sank and my eyes fell shut. The purpose of my journey had been to socialize, to become kinder and more accepting of others. And while that was obviously good, it seemed that in the process, I had also learned of all the reasons not to extend that kindness and acceptance to myself. I had been a pompous fool my entire life, parading around a strength that was as central to my identity as it was puny in the great scheme of things. 
suddenly a creaking noise woke me from my thoughts. Another hunter had joined me in my spot, his own ale in hand. He was a large man, wide and heavy in the way only the strongest men are. He wore fairly simple armor, scale plates covered by a large cloth. Despite the hood obscuring his face, I could make out the faded details of blonde hair and a thick beard. In a rough voice filled with surprising amiability, he asked me if I was alright. When I opened my mouth, I expected to answer with the usual, yeah, just tired, that I instinctively throw out whenever someone catches on to me moping. But for reasons I don't quite understand, the words that actually came out were entirely different. I, I always believed in my strength. Now... Not so much. Over and over again, I feel outclassed by both friends and foes, and I just keep wondering. How do I keep growing when my strength feels so meaningless in the face of that? As soon as I had said it, I felt so embarrassed that I wished the Devil Joe would invade the party and devour me instantly. Who starts a conversation like that? Glancing over to the gruff hunter, I expected the look of social disapproval I was so used to. But instead, the hunter seemed to be pondering my question sincerely, a soft smile on his face as he swirled his ale. Then, he began telling me a story. Long ago, he had been tasked to slay a sea beastie, his words, not mine, in the distant island district. Young as he was, he had thought it'd be easy. His sword was big and his muscles bigger. But the beastie evaded him at every opportunity. When he did manage to face it in combat, it wiped the floor with him. All the power he had been so proud of had mounted to nothing. What was worse, he had heard tales of other hunters dispatching the same creature with ease. According to the hunter, it took him weeks to figure out what was wrong. But the revelation had empowered him more than any training ever could have. On one occasion, he had managed to sneak up on the beast, but instead of immediately attacking, he had decided on a whim to observe it for a while. He watched it play in the sand, clean its maw, and enjoy the sun. That was the moment he became truly strong. My confusion must have been pretty visible on my face, as the gruff hunter snorted merrily and explained further. Confidence in oneself is a great thing, and opens many doors. But it can only bring you so far, as every person exists as just one small part of this enormous world. Where confidence cannot bring you, another temper can guide you. Respect and honor. The reason the sea beast had been able to thwart him was because he had only seen it as his quest target, a singular thing with a singular purpose. But when the gruff hunter had watched it play and sleep, he had understood that the beast didn't exist merely to be hunted by him. It was a thinking, feeling creature with more possible purposes than grains of sand were on the beach. By respecting it and considering it a fully-fledged being and not looking at it from the perspective of mere self-validation, the gruff hunter had subconsciously taken his task more seriously pushed his skills more fiercely, out of respect and a desire to honor the complexity and depth of the creature. Being physically strong leads to being dismissive of the weak, but freeing himself from that had allowed him to see the world as immeasurably beautiful and profound, something to be interacted with with the utmost humility. He had, soon after, succeeded in his assignment. To look upon the world not as a collection of obstacles and opportunities specifically for oneself, but as one giant network of unfathomable depth and beauty, one that existed neither to hinder nor to help oneself, that was what gave him true strength. This was true for monsters as well as for people. The strengths of others should not be seen as an affront to yours. Instead, it should be celebrated as an achievement and harnessed as motivation. Respecting the fact that others exist as sovereign entities with their own dreams and anxieties, and not simply as points of comparison for oneself, is a key step in being able to truly cooperate with and understand others. And so, he spoke, the strength of humankind united 
is the power to move the stars. The hunter finished his ale and put a hand on my shoulder. In life, he said, there are hunters, and then there are monster hunters. Any fool can swing a sword. True strength is to know how your sword fits into the world around you, and how you can honor those you fight and those who find themselves on your side equally. If you fall, those around you will lift you up, the same way you should lift them up when they fall. As long as you understand yourself as a link in a chain that spans all beings, man or monster, you are never truly alone. He patted me one last time and told me that he believes in me. With those words, he walked off, vanishing into the darkness of the festive night. I was not sure then what to think of this encounter, and even now, hours later, I still am not sure. All I know is that, as I go to bed, my sleep will surely be invaded by the gruff hunter's words. Perhaps I will wake up as someone else. Yeah, so I did in fact wake up to something fairly dramatic. It was, however, not a deep moment of personal growth. Rather, it was the sound of the alarm which rang through the early morning hours and alerted all of Elgato. Panic had taken over the outpost, and the moment I ventured outside, the reason became clear. A ruined island off the coast which we had sailed past without much thought before had entirely vanished. In its place, a giant sinkhole had appeared, immeasurably wide and likely equally as deep. That was by itself not the problem. The problem was what had seemingly crawled out of it. Due to the distance, the details were hard to make out in the dark, but a huge dark figure had visibly appeared at the edge of the chasm, its many arms flinging rock and debris onto Elgado. A few key buildings had already been hit, and fires had begun spreading. But most of all, the hole had begun swarming with small red flying creatures, the same bat-like critters that had surrounded Malzino. Seeing them circle the chasm finally jogged my memory. This was the image that the mural had depicted. The ruins of Fonron had tried to warn the discoverers of exactly this scenario. Admiral Gallius called in an emergency meeting and, unsurprisingly, announced that the outpost would immediately mount a counter-offensive on the unknown assailant. I immediately piped up and explained what I had gathered, showing them the sketch of the mural as well as describing the flying creatures I had seen detach from and leave Malzino's body. Bahari the scientist pondered that in the kingdom, an old legend tells of the Archdemon, who emerges from the abyss to command an army of a thousand bloodsuckers, directing them towards the ruin of all that is good and just. Gallius quickly dismissed the chatter. The only thing that mattered was to eliminate the threat. According to him, Elgado did have a weapon that could probably kill the giant creature, but it would need some time to be ready time in which the creature could raise Elgado to the ground. Thus, the plan was to send a small group of hunters in first, who would try to keep the monster occupied, and prevent it from throwing more rocks at the settlement until the weapon was ready. Naturally, Fiorain volunteered, and before I could even think about it, my hand shot up. I would go too. Ultimately, only Fiorain and I were sent in, since this was merely a distraction mission. As our boat approached the chasm, the creature did something strange. It stopped throwing rocks and began descending back into the hole. Was it asking us to follow it into the abyss? Either way, we could not turn back. We had to keep it busy and couldn't afford it re-emerging before the weapon was ready. And so, we descended as well. The abyss was surprisingly spacious and luminous. The sun had begun to rise, and its soft rays illuminated the giant chasm. Unfortunately, they also gave us a better look at our adversary. The monster was simply enormous, even larger than all of the Ucanlos I'd ever seen. Its blue skin looked fleshy and wrong, and its limbs were uncomfortably disproportionate. Its wing arms were enormous, 
and had been what the creature was using to launch the rocks at Elgado. Its face was even worse. Its jaw opened up into numerous segments, with its true lower jaw embedded into one of them, creating a massive gaping maw with light blue bioluminescent tissue on the inside. Its short horns and glowing red growths all across its body truly crowned it the Archdemon of the Abyss. There was no time for extended poetry, however. As soon as we touched ground in the chasm, the massive creature roared, and the red bats surrounded it rapidly. Fiorain and I quickly readied ourselves and entered the fray. Fighting such a titan was no easy task. It didn't have to attack us to crush us, and every movement it made could have been lethal. Moreover, its skin was extremely tough, and delivering a fatal blow seemed nearly impossible. Luckily, our job was merely to keep it active, to keep it focused on stomping and swiping at us. One thing we noticed was that while its skin was tough, the red growths around its body could be broken off. This didn't seem to hurt the giant, but produced a different effect. The red material was highly volatile, as one of its shards randomly exploded when the creature stepped on it. Fiorain nodded at me, and I understood the plan immediately. Our strategy shifted to trying to chip off as many of the red growths as possible. Large quantities of explosive material would surely be useful for something. As the battle progressed, the beast grew more irate. It had expected to swat us away like flies, and our continued resistance angered it. Its swipes became more ferocious and, after a wrathful roar, it lowered its head and created a vortex of wind as it sucked up air violently, hoping to simply devour us whole. Holding onto a rock for dear life, Fiorain and I saw our opportunity. The red fragments scattered all around the floor of the chasm were swept up in the vortex and immediately swallowed by the creature, filling its maw rapidly. A kunai throw from Fiorain ignited one of the fragments, and the entire head of the monster detonated in a massive fiery explosion. For a moment, it looked like our gamble had paid off. But then, the explosions didn't stop. Our planet started a chain reaction, as now all of the red growths on the monster's body began exploding, enveloping the entire creature in fire and smoke. And then... The smoke cleared. I had never been a religious hunter. Some choose gods and pantheons to worship, but I had never really believed in any of them. And yet, in that moment, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that the devil was real, and that he was standing right in front of me. The creature's back had caught fire, burning with an unnatural red glow that bathed the entire chasm in a hellish hue. Moreover, the red flying creatures had begun oscillating in the air, freely entering and exiting the monster's body through its mouth and through the flames on its back. When it moved next, it seemed entirely transformed. The flames on its body propelled it forwards at impossible speeds, a proverbial mountain barreling at us with the swiftness of a palamute. Moreover, each movement now left behind clusters of fiery energy, emanating from its back and exploding into small, devastating suns. The heat was starting to become unbearable, and I could feel my breath shortening. There was no time to recover. The creature was now fully focused on annihilating us. Suddenly, one orb that I hadn't noticed appeared right next to me, and before I could react, detonated violently. I was thrown to the ground every inch of my body burning in pain, and my head ringing in shrill panic. My armor had protected me well. Nothing had been broken or torn off, simply battered. And yet, I did not get up. I lay there, my eyes forced shut, and waited for the next attack. I had failed. Again and again I had let everyone around me down. I'd pushed everyone away for a career I ended up throwing away for the dumbest reasons possible. I had tried to recover, to grow, but I still only ended up as dead weight. I had never been strong. I had never been anything. 
So, now, it was only right that I return to the nothingness I deserve. Then, through the ringing, new sounds entered my head. Fiorain grunting and the monster roaring. I opened my eyes slightly and saw her, fighting not to kill the beast, but to protect me. The monster was trying to end me, and she was deflecting every attack, ignoring possible openings so as to not leave my side. Next to me, she had thrown a health potion. Why was she doing this, I wondered. She barely knew me. To her, I was simply that one hunter that had messed up during the Malzino hunt, and that had now been foolish enough to get hit. Why would she risk her life for... a fellow hunter? Because that is what we do. My head filled with a strange voice, not unlike that of the gruff hunter. Because we are all in the same boat, living beings doing our best. As long as you understand yourself as a part of that, you are never truly alone. Fiorain was protecting me because that is what true strength is. To value the world around you unconditionally, to cherish and protect that which is within your grasp, and to help and learn from others, be they closest friends or random strangers. Animated by these feelings, I forced myself back on my feet. I drank the potion, and I stood my ground. And most importantly, I kept my eyes wide open. I had to see the world I was meant to cherish. In life, there were hunters and then, there were monster hunters. And I was finally ready to become the latter. As Fiorain and I resumed our assault, I watched her closely, not with jealousy or despair, but with true, undying respect. Her movements were gracious, her techniques superb, but there were gaps, blind spots that I hadn't seen before. I was looking at her finally as a person not as a part of my story. She wasn't inhumanly strong. She was a person doing her best, and I was going to help her. As if in a dance, I matched my attacks with hers, positioned myself right where I could have her back, reinforced her strikes against the creature whenever I could. When a monster unleashed its flames, we pushed and pulled each other out of harm's way in unison. Her strength, coupled with my resolve, was paving the road to victory. We now just had to walk it. Then, as we continued to rush our adversary, a new light lit up the chasm. A signal flare, fired from Elgado, flew high in the sky above us. The weapon was ready. Just as we had been briefed, both Fiorain and I fired our own signal flares to confirm the strike. The attack would come from above, and so our flares conveniently also directed the creature's gaze upwards. Hurrying behind some rocks, we got to safety as the attack commenced. A massive projectile, a dragon scorcher, descended from the sky, a massive metal spear with an attached explosive payload. The spear embedded itself in the creature's body before exploding violently, a massive plume of fire ripping apart the monster's face. Through the smoke, we could see that it had not been enough to kill the beast, merely daze it. However, its head had been damaged, and a large gash in its tough skin had opened up. A strike there would surely bring victory. All we had to do was scale the enormous beast. An impossible task for one hunter. But not so for two monster hunters. Fiorain and I began running, with me taking the lead. A few paces away from the dragon, I turned around and readied the flat side of my greatsword, while Fiorain continued to sprint towards me at full speed. As she reached me, she did not slow down, instead running right up my greatsword. Simultaneously, I lifted my blade violently, launching the Dame Knight far into the air, high enough to reach the monster's head. As the beast's eyes seemed to return to consciousness, Dame Fiorain descended down upon it, plunging her blade deep into the open gash and penetrating the creature's brain. A thunderous roar and whining convulsion later, the giant monster fell to the ground, its life extinguished.
the archdemon of the abyss, was no more. As Fiorain and I shook hands in celebration, I watched the red bat creatures shrivel and die in midair. Their connection to this massive monster would surely be the topic of much research. Curiously, some of them didn't seem to die right away, instead flying higher and out of the chasm into the horizon. I cannot tell you how glad I am to be writing an entry without having just gone through life-altering trauma shortly before, for once. It's now been roughly two weeks since we fought the Archdemon. In that time, the guild managed to classify both it and the critters it controlled. The big boy is now officially called Geismagorm, categorized as an elder dragon, and the bat-like creatures have been named Curio. As you can imagine, the aftermath of the fight was full of research and classifications such as these, and surprisingly, I have been enjoying it quite a lot. Shortly after we slayed Geismagorm, I actually approached Bahari and volunteered to aid with the research efforts surrounding the Curio, partially because I felt newly motivated and partially because I felt compelled to learn more about these bizarre creatures. Bahari seemed quite surprised at the suggestion, especially coming from me, but was ultimately very happy to have consistent help. Together, we began unraveling the mystery of the Curio. To do so, we analyzed three samples. A dead Curio, tissue from Geismagorm's mouth, and a collection of materials gathered from Malzino's corpse. These were the keystones of our investigation, and they almost immediately began yielding insights. The Curio are a species of parasites that predominantly live in the underground tunnels deep beneath the surface. They have vestigial eyes, wispy wings, and a round mouth filled with countless sharp teeth, reminiscent of the maw of a lamprey. Using these teeth, they can latch onto any living creature and begin sucking its blood. Uniquely, they seem to possess the ability to convert the blood they suck directly into a sort of ephemeral energy the red flames we had seen erupting from Geismagorm. This ability, as well as their physical fragility, makes the Curio ideal candidates for symbiotic relationships. Such, that is how they relate to the Geismagorm. The large Elder Dragon allows the Curio to nest in and on its body in safety, and in return, the Curio venture out, returning with copious amounts of converted life energy which they share with their host. This relationship informs the Geismagorm's lifestyle. While it generally lives underground like the Curio, it doesn't seem to hunt. Instead, it periodically digs up massive chasms to release swarms of Curio, which attack and convert all surrounding life into energy for their master. While our findings had made sense thus far, one issue was Malzino. While it was visibly covered in Curio and their bites, the parasites had not been weakening it. To the contrary, the Curio obeyed its commands and empowered its attacks. How was that possible if Geismagorum was the host? What made this more complicated was the cultural history of the Malzino. In the region, it has long been known as a forest guardian, a stern but well-meaning protector of the land. How exactly did such a beloved creature turn into the bloody monstrosity Fiorain faced not long ago? The answer presented itself from an unlikely source. An old historic record dated to just before Malzino destroyed the citadel. In it, the local doctor at the time described a mysterious epidemic that appeared out of nowhere, a plague that took a few dozen lives. The symptoms seemed fairly normal. Fever, weakness of the limbs, nausea, except for the fact that the afflicted skin becomes bathed in a dark red hue, seemingly unrelated to blood flow. Additionally, the infected would grow aggressive and violent, flailing around with no regard of their own well-being. The doctor noted that this disease was a considerable anomaly. Upon reading this report, Bahari perked up. Prior to the slaying of Malzino, numerous hunters had fallen ill, the reason I had been enlisted as backup in the first place, and their symptoms had been identical right down to the red hue on the skin. They had only been cured by a special antidote made with espinos venom. 
Taking a blood sample of the recovered hunters and comparing it to the saliva extracted from the curio confirmed our suspicion. The curio carry in them a deadly virus, likely involved in how they convert blood into energy. This virus is what actually kills their prey. There was even an explanation for why no curio had been seen during the outbreak described in the old text. We had already found curio with drastically different sizes and shapes, some as big as a cat and others as small as a marble. Would it be that crazy to suggest that juvenile curio are too small to be easily seen by the naked human eye, and that it was such a juvenile swarm that triggered the original outbreak all those years ago? But so, how did Malzino fit into all of this? Another fluid comparison provided the final clue. By exposing samples of curious saliva to both the antidote and the recovered blood of Malzino revealed that they both severely weakened and dissolved the curio virus. Thus, the Malzino must have developed some kind of antibody in its blood to survive the attack of the curio. Seeing that they couldn't kill him, the curio might have decided to take the Malzino as their new pseudo host. Thus, we constructed our core theory and timeline of events. Curio are small blood-sucking parasites that kill using a virus in their saliva. When young, they are too small to be seen by a human eye. They need a host to nest in, with whom they share the collected blood and energy as rent. That host is usually a geismagorm, which breaches the surface regularly to let its bonded curio swarm out to bring it nourishment from their victims. Fifty years ago, this happened, and a swarm of juvenile, invisible curio swept across the land. Initially, this led to sickness and death in humans, but the enormous Geismagorm likely need enormous amounts of energy to maintain their size. So, the curio moved on to monsters, which became violent and aggressive as a result of the virus, overrunning and destroying the citadel in the process. The exception to that was Malzino, who seemingly actively battled the Geismagorm as described in many local legends. The Malzino managed to push back Geismagorm, but not before being itself infected by the Curio. However, for whatever reason, the Malzino's body began producing powerful antibodies that severely weakened the effects of the virus, allowing it to live despite the numerous Curio attached to it. The Curio, in turn, decided to bond to Malzino instead of returning to Geismagorm, as he required less maintenance as a host and also fed more frequently. Thus, the Malzino became a pseudo-host, a bond which twisted it considerably. While the virus couldn't kill it, being constantly exposed to it likely led to its heightened aggression and violence. When we killed Malzino, the Curio on its body simply abandoned their false king, returning to their original host who, newly empowered, sought to breach the surface once more, hence why the Geismagorm appeared immediately after our victory over the Malzino. With this central theory established, Bahari and I began distributing antidotes and Curio capture kits to hunters, in order to widen our reach and further our research. Our little effort even received a name by Gallius, the Anomaly Research Lab, named after the way the doctor had described the curio virus. For a while, our findings remained consistent with our theory, as the hunters of Elgado sought to weed out the last remaining curio. It seemed like we had it all under control. But then, concerning reports began arriving at our desk. First, there was an outbreak of curio virus infections that could not be cured through conventional antidotes. These cases were notably more extreme, with infected individuals screaming and yelling incessantly. Another odd new symptom was muscular swelling. The local head doctor, a vivarian named Tadori, told us that the only way to make the antidote stronger is to infuse it with an even more powerful venom. But where would we get something even more potent than Espinas venom? Luckily, this hurdle was solved somewhat easily. I gave Tadori the vial of flaming Espina sulfur I had received from the frontier hunter in Fonron, and asked him to see if this would work. Mere hours later, we had a new antidote that indeed worked on the new cases. Epidemic curbed, for now. What followed, however, was a lot more worrying. After the defeat of Geismagorm, 
we had assumed there were only a few more curio left, and that we would soon be able to close the book on them. But now, we began to find more and more corpses of monsters drained by the curio, indicating an increase in their population. The real shock, however, came when an infected Arzuros was observed alive. From what we had gathered so far, an infected monster was aggressive and violent, but ultimately quite weak, drained by the curio and turned delirious by the virus. But this Arzuros was anything but. It was faster, stronger, and fiercer than any Arzuros ever sighted by the guild. What's more, it could even harness the power of the curio. It was observed creating a massive blast of red energy around it when it was enraged. And lastly, it was itself able to infect others with the curio virus, something no other infected individual had been able to do. This was an issue of an entirely new magnitude, and monsters such as these, afflicted monsters as we began calling them, continued to become more frequent. Analysis of the materials recovered from one such individual revealed that their tissues were completely saturated in curio energy and fluids, just like the samples of Geismagorm. Before we could even really ponder on how this could be possible, even more bad news came our way. Letters from other regions started pouring in, describing that they too were under assault of the afflicted monsters. A few letters even came from Kamura village and from Utsushi. In them, he explained the devastating consequences of these new infected monsters. Their incredible aggression, coupled with the fact that they seem to appear without warning and out of thin air, riles up the entire ecosystem and creates chaos, which itself leads to the emergence of dangerous and usually reclusive species that are either attracted by the commotion or enraged by it. For example, the shrine ruins near Kamura had apparently been beset by a chaotic Gormagala, an exceedingly rare variant of Gormagala. These individuals form when a Gormagala attempts to molt into its adult form while being too close to a relative that had already molted. When a mature Shagaru Magala is born, it releases an airborne chemical that ensures that no other Magala can molt in its territory successfully, and try to usurp it. Should a juvenile Gormagala nonetheless try, it will malform into a chaotic gore, a half-thing shrouded in agony. These creatures are extremely dangerous, and one appearing that close to the village was a big problem. Another report had discovered the presence of seething basil geese and metal rafts in the areas near as well, further compounding the severe knock-on effects on the environment this plague was having. One researcher even claimed to have seen a Velcana on the Frost Island archipelago. If this epidemic was about to catalyze Elder Dragon activity, we were in big trouble. There had also been some unexpected benefits, however. In the Infernal Springs, the accursed valley in which Utsushi and I fought Amatsu, the guild had discovered an entirely new species likely brought forth by the afflicted commotion. Violet Mizutsune, a never-before-seen rare species of Mizutsune. This blue and purple relative of Yukumo's soap leviathan is special in that it secretes an entirely unique type of liquid, synovial fluid, a substance similar to oil that is highly flammable. Unlike oil, however, it burns a bright bluish white and can melt through anything. This fluid can also be used to combat curio infections, as was discovered by Kamuran doctors. Utsushi had thus included a box of vials full of the stuff, asking us to synthesize an even more powerful antidote for the boys on the front lines of the crisis. So, that is where we are at. Afflicted monsters are running amok, while powerful variants and rare species are emerging to join the chaos. And connecting all of that is the Curio's new strange behavior. Their empowering of afflicted monsters, the new virus, their growing populations. It all led to one conclusion, one that I had shared with Bahari earlier today, one that we both, with great horror, had to admit was probably correct. The Curio were transforming, speciating, evolving into a new, more powerful variation. And who knows what awaits us at the other side of that evolution.
this may be my final entry. So I will try my hardest to compile all the relevant information. The affliction of the Curio Plague continued to worsen. More and more monsters became infected, and more worryingly, it started affecting increasingly more powerful creatures. What initially began as a disease mostly spread in Arzuros and Volvidon, now also ravaged Astalos and Zenogar. Even powerhouses such as Rajang and Espinas were not spared. Every day, new reports of afflicted monsters and infected hunters poured into the research lab, where we were not any closer in understanding what exactly was happening. This changed with two key events. For one, a hunter managed to snag a dead curio off of a defeated beast, meaning that we now had a sample of these newly evolved curio populations. The second, and much more problematic event, was the emergence of the Risen. As we watched the curio infect stronger and stronger monsters, a thought began to gnaw at me, and surely at Bahari too. If the Curio were working themselves up to more powerful targets, then the only logical conclusion was that they would eventually infect Elder Dragons. The only known case of an infected Elder Dragon had thus been Malzino, and he had been fierce indeed. What would happen if this would begin affecting other Elders? We did not have to wait long to get our answer. A panicked report from a Kamura hunter described an awful encounter with an abnormal Camellios. This extremely scarred individual had employed numerous behaviors never before seen in Camellios, such as new ways to utilize its poison mucus. But most strikingly, when enraged, it had been wreathed in a shroud of orange energy, which had increased its power many fold. The hunter had barely escaped with his life. Before long, numerous reports of bizarre elder dragons with heavy scarring and unusual physical features began appearing. A dark purple Kushala Daora that emits golden gusts of wind. A bright blonde Teostra that creates fireballs as it moves. An orange Valstrax whose wing claws shred armor to ribbons. And, most worryingly, a grey Shagaru Magala that can split the ground in frenzied fury. But what all of these had in common was that odd orange energy state in which their power increased further. On one occasion, a terrified huntress managed to inflict a deep wound on the abnormal Kushala Daora and escape, allowing us to analyze the blood on her blade. Our suspicions were confirmed. These anomalous elders were indeed doused in curio virus. What's more, the intense scarring on their bodies suggested that they had likely suffered from many of the known symptoms of the curio affliction at one point. But instead of dying, they had conquered the affliction and risen above it, gaining newfound power in the process. Thus, the guild dubbed them Risen Elder Dragons. With all that we knew about the Curio, Geismagorm, Malzino, the new Curio strain we had received and now the Risen Elders, Bahari and I managed to map out a full theory on how the new Curio work and how afflicted and Risen monsters come to be. Our original theory on how the Curio under Geismagorm worked seemed to still be fairly accurate. The original population of Curio, bound to Geismagorm, fed on prey to deliver energy to their host. But two key events changed the trajectory of the small parasites. One was the infection of the Malzino, which resisted the virus and accidentally became a pseudo-host for the Curio. The second was our slaying of Geismagorm, which left the Curio stranded and without a host. By all means, they should have simply died of starvation and exposure to the elements. But life is nothing if not tenacious. Because of the Malzino incident, these Curio, perhaps subconsciously, understood that with enough luck, they could find a host other than their original Geismagorm. This desire to survive and the accompanying desperation led to these Curio evolving. Instead of merely feeding on prey, they now began flooding some of their targets with the energy they had accumulated. 
At the same time, the Kyuru began infecting their targets with their new virus, which didn't weaken the infected but rather strengthened them, heightening their muscular activity as well as their aggression. In short, the Kyurio were trying to forcibly turn some of their victims into a new host, by flooding them with power to entice a symbiosis. But the Kyurio were used to the enormous and powerful Geismagorm, and the combination of energy and the virus effects were way too much for the smaller, weaker bodies of non-Elder Dragon monsters. These doomed hosts, driven mad by a gifted power they could never control, were what we had designated as afflicted monsters. They were destined to die as the Curio continued to pump them full of energy until their very flesh disintegrates under the pressure and violence. But as the Curio worked their way up the food chain, they eventually found adequate hosts, the Risen Elder Dragons. However, as we had found them, they too had not yet been fully transformed into Curio hosts, namely because the parasites were nowhere to be seen, unlike with the Malzino or the Geismagorm. Until an elder was killed and brought in for study, there would be no certainty in this, but we theorized that this was an intermediate step, in which the Curio entered the potential host's body entirely and began preparing it from the inside. The final form of these dragons, once they have fully bonded with the Curio, would likely be similar to that of the Malzino. This is also consistent with historical records of Malzino. When old texts describe the species, they refer to physical attributes that the individual we encountered didn't have. A helmet-like growth on the head, shoulder rings, wide neck plates. It is likely that bonding with the Curio has them chisel away at the body, reshaping it for their needs, just as it was now happening with the Risen Elders, whose bodies were gradually changing as well. It wasn't much and full of conjecture, but this theory was all we had. More crucially, it provided two core assumptions. That the afflicted monsters would eventually die off on their own and were thus low priority, and that the Risen Elders were the true dangers that, if slain, would lead to the Curio population rapidly declining again, as their bodies are probably currently being used as the multiplication nests. With this at the front of our theory, we sent our findings to all affected areas and implored them to prioritize the slaying of these risen dragons. Much to our relief, all scholars in all villages agreed to our assessment, and the risen extermination front was spearheaded. The first to go down was the risen Camellios, who was struck down in the shrine ruins by none other than Utsushi. Nice one. Risen Kushala was next being vanquished by a fellow Dandorman hunter in the Terosu jungle. Teostra, Valstrax, and Shagaru proved more problematic, but a joint front of eastern hunting parties allowed for their eventual slaying as well. We requested a few samples of the Risen Shagaru Magala specifically, as the interplay between the Curio virus and the Frenzy virus was extremely fascinating. Our more deepened understanding of the Frenzy virus compared to the Curio might help us develop more sophisticated vaccines and antidotes. As the Risen began to fall, the number of reported afflicted monsters dropped in tandem. Our theory had seemingly been correct. With no functional hosts to speak of, the Curio's reign continued to dwindle, as they died off one by one. With the defeat of Risen Shagaru Magala, cases dropped rapidly, and we were expecting it to hit near zero soon. As Bahari and I celebrated, it seemed that the worst part had been survived. But one last complication came knocking. As part of our efforts to monitor the cases of afflicted monsters, we had devised a system wherein every village with an active hunting post had to check in with us every few days via carrier pigeon or cohoot, until they reported zero new cases. Out of the blue, some villages just stopped reporting in. At first, it seemed like a fluke. Someone might have forgotten to send a letter, or it might have gotten lost on the way, or some disgruntled hunter just didn't bother with it for one time. But then the silence continued. And before long, numerous hunting posts in the same area had gone completely dark. We knew this couldn't be good, and so Bahari and I left for one of the villages, 
the nearest one, to see what was up. We expected a few things. We did not, however, expect utter devastation. The village in question had been entirely flattened, raised to the ground by what looked like a fierce battle. Houses were split in two, fields were scorched, roads annihilated. Bodies littered the place. But more eerily, the area was littered with dead curio. While they die of hunger and exposure fairly quickly, it is fairly hard for a human to kill the nimble and evasive parasites. For there to be this many dead ones, and with these kinds of wounds, no human had done this. This was the work of a monster systematically killing off the curio. As we made our way through the ruin, we found a single hunter who was still alive, stuck under rubble and severely dehydrated. As we pulled him out, he repeated a single word, one name emerging from his croaking lips. Malzino. After securing the survivors of the villages, an emergency council was convened at Elgado. Gallius and Bahari spoke of what the hunter's words implied. Seeing the size and shape of the wounds and damages to the towns, as well as the presence of so many dead curio and the eyewitness reports, suggested that this was another Malzino. One that didn't control the curio, but one that fought them so fiercely that their battles destroyed entire villages. The old tales tell of the original guardian of this land, and many of the reports on these incidents seem to line up with the descriptions of the old dragon. This was, most likely, a Malzino that had never been infected by the curio, and that had spent the last 50 years fighting the affliction after Gais Magorn's appearance. But now, with these new, desperate curio, it was fighting more ferociously than before, its temper agitated by the newly increased danger. If the curio managed to bond with this Malzino as they did with the other one, it would kickstart the entire plague again and set us back tremendously. Thus, it was decided that this primordial Malzino had to be killed immediately, before it could become a host. It was late, so the meeting was postponed to the morning, where we would decide on who would go, and what exactly to do. This would require perfect planning and assignment. If this dragon was as strong as the legend said, it would pulverize anyone but a true master hunter instantly. As I am writing this, I know that this may be my final entry. I know I have to go. I could not leave this alone, and I have to see it through to the end. I know that I will go. I do not, however, know that I will return. Dear Journal, it has been quite a journey, hasn't it? The conference on the day of the hunt was, frankly, quite discouraging. Due to the wide-spanning nature of our afflicted recon missions, most hunters were currently unavailable, as they were still to return from their quests. Between that, regular business, and the delegation of the Risen Extermination, the outpost was stretched extremely thin. Thus. The only warriors who were available and had a chance of victory were Fiorain and myself. As we approached the citadel, where the dragon had been sighted at night, I reminisced about my journey so far. I could barely imagine now that I had been sent to Kamura as a punishment, much less for something as barbaric and stupid as killing a random animal. I sometimes wished I could go back and apologize to that poor Kelby, but... That's not how life works. I must move forward. I truly, genuinely regret my actions, but I also cherish the bonds and experiences I had made. I had learned to invite others into my life and to cooperate with them, to see their skills and inspirations instead of challenges, to enjoy simple kindnesses shared in fleeting relationships. This had been good for me. So, 
it was only right to end it, one way or another, by facing a truly dangerous foe. As we made our way to the castle of the citadel, we spotted it. Looking upon its true form, the Malzino we had fought previously appeared all the more tragic. The shining silver scales and golden horns of this primordial Malzino, its royal blue wing membranes, its gorgeous osteoderms, all features that would be lost to the affliction, eaten away by the horrible parasites. It hadn't noticed us yet. It was engaged in a battle against the swarming Curio, which seemed to eagerly await their chance to attach themselves to the dragon. Knowing that we had made it just in time, Fiorain and I jumped at the dragon in unison, an unmistakable challenge to the resurrected legend. The primordial Malzino cried out in acknowledgement. A breeze swept to the field. A single moment of silence. And then, the fight of a lifetime began. Every single move the Malzino made would mean instant death if it ever as much as grazed either of us. It used its armored wings as shield and sword simultaneously, the edge a destructive blade that split the earth, and the outer membrane an impenetrable wall. The Malzino had every range covered, and approaching it meant looking the reaper in the eye. But we were no novices. I was no longer afraid. Together, Fiorain and I weaved through the onslaught, dodging every wing and tail, until we were close to the monster, pressuring it with our blades. Where I was open, Fiorain countered. Where she was left defenseless, I reared the creature back to me. The Malzino did not relent, did not flinch. And so, we were locked in combat for hours, or maybe mere seconds. Time meant nothing. There was only death, danger, and the hunt. As our muscles began to ache, it became clear that this war of attrition would not end well for Fiorain and me. Determined to grasp victory, I swung my blade full force onto one of the dragon's horns and chipped it. The primordial Mazino roared in pain and reeled back. Just then, as the dragon was distracted, the Curio descended upon it, swarming it violently, trying desperately to attach themselves to it. There were fewer individuals than the usual Curio swarm we had observed. To me, at least, it was obvious that these Curio were the last of their original crop. They were facing existential stakes and would not go down without a fight. The primordial Malzino extended its wings explosively. The wind pressure dispersed the Curio but it wasn't enough. Some had already latched on and began pouring their energy and virus into the dragon. As the Malzino alighted with a familiar glow, Fiorain and I knew that we were running out of time. This Malzino was a true warrior, a protector that had fought the plague for half a century. Even now, unpowered by the Curio, it was a foe with no equal. Should it become a true host of the Parasites, it would likely be unstoppable. And so, we resumed our battle. The Malzino's moves were now supplemented by the dreaded Curio energy, which burst forth as beams, orbs, and explosions. It summoned cores of energy around it, descending upon us like cursed stars. It was clear that the Curio were trying pathetically hard to impress their prospective host with just how much power they could give it. Perhaps they hoped the Malzino would grow to like what they offered. Either way, it was not enough. Both Fiorain and I had spent months fighting and studying afflicted monsters, so dealing with these new abilities was actually much easier than it perhaps should have been. Ultimately, the Curio were one-trick ponies, and all the energy in the world meant nothing when wielded against those that could just dodge it reliably. Additionally, the Malzino was clearly not happy with this arrangement. It howled in frustration every time Curio energy burst forth from its body. The battle was reaching its climax. Fiorain and I were consistently getting hits in, chipping away at the Malzino's armor bit by bit. The dragon itself seemed to be out of breath. While we had uninflicted any substantial injury, fighting both us and the Curio at the same time was obviously sapping its strength. 
We were all ready for one final clash. One honorable fight that would determine our destinies. One last. We were robbed of it. The winded Malzino took one too many exhausted breaths, and the remaining cure in the area went all in on one final gamble. All of them attached themselves to the dragon at once, some even entering its mouth, and began eating away at it. The primordial Malzino screams were drowned out by the crackling of curio energy, crescendoing into a massive orange explosion. Once the smoke cleared, there stood a new kind of creature. The skin of the dragon had blackened, and its wounds and wing membranes had begun to glow with a familiar orange light. The Curio were fed up with waiting for their host. They were no longer simply empowering the Malzino, but instead forcing a premature risen state, perhaps in hopes of accelerating the symbiosis. This bloodened Malzino was a far cry from anything I had ever fought. Its noble demeanor had vanished, replaced by crawling, hungry movements that left no room to breathe. It could accelerate to even more disastrous speeds, vanishing from sight twice, three times in a row, before picking its target. Its graceful wings were now folded into grotesque claws, which could harness wind pressure itself to send waves of debris flying at us. And all the while its body was spitting out curio energy continuously, turning the entire battlefield into a horrid inferno. A battle that had seemed somewhat manageable mere seconds ago had now turned into a waking nightmare, and both Fiorain and I could do nothing but defend ourselves desperately. Actually attacking the creature seemed like a distant impossibility now. Or it did, until help came in an unexpected form. The Malzino had just sent a wave of energy through the ground and was readying its next attack when it suddenly ceased. Its muscles began convulsing and its body trembled violently. Confused, I looked at the dragon and it looked back, directly into my eyes. In its gaze, I saw a plea, a desperate request for help. Simultaneously, it slowly moved its front leg towards me, still shaking intensely. On its arm, numerous curio had latched on. Malzino was fighting against the affliction and was asking me for help. Immediately, I swung my sword at the parasites, cleaving them apart and freeing that arm of curio. The Malzino howled and shook further, and I yelled at Fiorain to target the curio directly. Bit by bit, we freed the dragon of parasites until enough of them were gone that it could shake them off in one heavy wing strike. Its skin returned to normal, and its orange glow subsided. But some curio remained, eager to immediately reattach themselves to the elder dragon. The primordial Malzino, clearly in pain, took flight and attempted to escape both the curio and us, eventually crashing in the ruins of the nearby castle. We both followed the dragon, running up the steps of the castle into the ruins of the old throne room. Here, the tired Malzino was desperately holding off the curio, but its moves were sloppy and its attacks labored. If we didn't slay it soon, it would surely succumb to the curio. I could sense Fiore next to me readying herself for an assault, but for some reason, my sword felt heavy. Looking upon this dragon, this ancient guardian, fighting for dear life, didn't fill me with determination or grit, just sheer, profound sadness. It had defended its land dutifully, and what would it get in return? The choice between death and insanity. It had done nothing wrong, and yet... For a moment, I thought of my journey so far, and soon after, I had made my decision. As Fiorain lifted her weapon, I stopped her. We would not kill an innocent creature. We would not punish a victim. Malzino was not the enemy. The true monster here, and the target of our fury, would be the few remaining curio. Fiorain seemed outraged at first. This was personal for her. The other Malzino had killed most of her hometown, after all. But even she could not shake the feeling of shame when thinking about killing this dragon. 
It was defending itself from a fate worse than death. Simple as that. After some thought, she nodded. And, for the first time in our lives, we entered the fray to fight alongside a monster. At first, the Malzino seemed confused. Our attacks were no longer directed at it, and we actively shielded its skin from the curious teeth. Before long, however, it understood, and, with what I interpreted to be as a hopeful bellow, it aided us in our mission. Using its wings, it directed the curio through wind currents into convenient spots, where we could easily kill them with our human-sized weapons. On one occasion, a curio decided to launch itself at me, perhaps in anger, but the Malzino used its wing to shield me. The curio was then quickly cut in half by Fiorain. This back and forth continued for hours, as night came and went. Exhausted, we simply fought on, until, finally, the last curio fell, ripped apart by our combined might. I don't think either of us saw who struck the final blow. The sun was rising, and the previously overcast sky was making space for its young rays. Tired, we turned towards the primordial Malzino, unsure of what would happen next. But the dragon seemed at peace. As the sun kissed the ruins of the castle, in this room where once counts and barons were crowned, the kingdom had regained its most stalwart protector. The Malzino extended its wings fully, displaying its brilliant blue membrane. It gave us a quick glance, even a nod, before flying off into the horizon. On this new day, as the silver guardian of the kingdom roared in triumph across the skies, we knew that we had finally, truly succeeded. We simply stood there as the clouds parted, suspended in time under this gentle, shining sunbreak. A very special thank you to all of our patrons, including Fictionape, Arcturian711, Claire Miboon, Danilo Villavicencio, Dissi, Emperor EV, Geo, Hubblemirror123, Jameson Tate, Magenta Magenta, Kane Eddy, Makot O2, Mr. Pyramid, Mr. Meander, Mr. Chef, Orbital, Pide Fuego, Oak Wood Tree, Peroscoco, Person 212, Project Iceman, Rambling Robin, Russell, Terador, Iron Camel, Courage, and Sir Newt Newt. My dear journal, it has been some time since I last wrote here. Don't get any ideas. This is definitely the final time. I simply like closure. I have returned to Kamura, where I now enjoy my time corresponding with various scholars around the globe, sharing and comparing research notes, as well as commissioning and sometimes leading expeditions. Who knew that a brutish greatsword warrior could become such a lover of science? I had never thought about it before, but here I am, enjoying it. But most of the time, I sit in peace in our house. 
It is the perfect size, and both Utsushi and I do our best to keep it clean and tidy. He tends to be out more, so I make sure everything is in order for when he returns. Before I forget, the guild administration of Dandorma heard of my victories in the region and decided to reinstate my old guild status, once again recognizing my previous achievements. My record was cleared. They even wished to return my prized Rathalos blade to me. Unfortunately, I uh, could not be bothered to pick it up. I'm fine where I'm now. Nothing if not tenacious, the Dundorman administration sent my weapon to me via courier anyway. It arrived in peak condition, and for a moment I admired it, the beautiful craftsmanship. But not for too long. It now hangs in our home here in Kamura. Its purpose is no longer violence. Instead, it simply sits here. A reminder of who I was, and a promise to who I now am.